Okay. Welcome to the third Entrepreneurship Expo contest. My name is Henrietta Onwebuzia and I lead sessions in entrepreneurship at the Lagos Business School. Um, this is going to be an, a great opportunity for us to witness many of the impact-driven um, innovative ideas by our students, both past and present. Um, before I start, I'm going to just give an overview of the objective we try to achieve in helping our students become impact-driven entrepreneurs who will accelerate the development of Africa, of Nigeria and Africa as a whole. However, it's important that we explain why we, have, we emphasize impacts. So in 1970, the economist Milton Friedman argued that the sole purpose of a business is to create profits for its, shareho for its shareholders. And he concluded that profit maximization is justified for shareholders and for the risk taken by investors. This has had a tremendous impact on how people view businesses and consequently the strategy they apply. Now, fortunately, when businesses see their goal as solely profit maximization, they consciously or subconsciously tend to have an exploitative mindset that seeks to make as much profit as possible, even at the expense of the customer. This leads them to produce substandard products which eventually erodes their markets, as customers so cheated never tend to return. This is the basis of the traditional aversion for made in Nigeria products, which was the same in the 70s and 80s for made in China products, and a bit of that remains to date. Now, on the other hand, decades before Milton Friedman, it was understood that the purpose of business is to serve society. Indeed, the Jews who are the richest in the world, anywhere you find them, have 10 commandments of creating wealth. And the first of these commandments states that you must be creating value to society for you to have sustainable demand. This is also reaffirmed by Jack Ma, the wealthiest entrepreneur in China, who says, if you want to remain small, solve small problems. If you want to be big, solve big problems. What this means is that the stronger or wider your impact, the more money you make. So impact and profit are therefore compatible, contrary to what you traditionally believe to be, think that impact is for nonprofits and profit is for the people who are interested in making money. We see good examples of impact-driven entrepreneurs who are very wealthy in both Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, who are currently the wealthiest entrepreneurs in the world. None of them plan to be the wealthiest entrepreneurs in the world. They were just passionate about solving problems. In the case of Bill Gates, he wanted to put a PC on every desk and help people be more creative, and so invented the personal computer, which was before then a huge mainframe that was owned only by huge organizations. And when his invention, when his solution was, was produced, it, was a, it, it, it caught on all over the world. And as a, result, as, a, as a result of the strong demand, he became very wealthy. Similarly, Jeff Bezos was interested in solving the problem of creating convenience when you want to buy a book to start with and eventually other products. And so he created Amazon to solve this problem. Amazon was so convenient and so useful for many people. And similarly, he attracted sufficient demand to make him, to shoot him up to become the wealthiest man in the world that he is today. So both these entrepreneurs were focused on solving problems and they ended up attracting huge, huge demand that made them super wealthy. The above shows that for entrepreneurs to be successful and sustainable, there needs to be a paradigm shift from the mindset of profit maximization to being impact driven or solution driven because every problem is actually a potentially profitable business opportunity. As the COVID pandemic triggers a wave of economic paralysis around the globe, businesses are gasping desperately for survival strategies. Only those who have a problem-driven mindset will be able to see the opportunities because in every changing circumstance, there are new opportunities and new threats. There are new problems today. So the entrepreneurs who are able to key into providing solutions for solving these problems will survive. Right, so that's just a general overview to help you understand why at LBS we focus on developing impact-driven entrepreneurs who will accelerate Nigeria's social, um, sustainable development as well as that of the rest of Africa. Now, today we have with us um, a number of um, panelists and uh, exhibitors who will be contesting. We will also be showing, sharing with you um, their various um, 
ideas. But before then, I'm just going to run through the agenda for today's program. Um, just give me a minute to get to it. Right. So the agenda for today's program will start with the keynote address, which will be delivered by Michele Lepe, the founder and managing director of InterSwitch Limited. This will be followed by um, a question and answer session from 11.45 to 12 o'clock. And then we will go into the Growth Plan Entrepreneurship Contest. We have six contest, MBA contestants for you today. And after the contest, we will have a panel discussion on how, on building and sustainable, building and sustaining successful businesses during and beyond COVID-19. Um, at some point, the MBA director, Dr. Ochena Uzo, will, will join us. But um, I will just like to call on Michele Legwe, the founder and managing director of InterSwitch Limited, to start with his keynote address. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Aretha. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm hoping you guys can hear me loud and clear. Uh, it's a big honor to be able to address you remotely like this. And perhaps this is a sign of the time that we are in. But the good news is that it's a time, it's not a season. And I'll talk about this much later in the course of my address. So what I have done is I have prepared a very short presentation to use. Um, and I think it, it would be a very useful way for us to to start to this um, discussion. So I'll just quickly Okay. I'm assuming you all can see my screen. Yes, we can. We can, yes. Thank you very much. So We are in a situation where I, for example, have been in numerous sessions by experts talking about COVID-19, the implications for business, the implications for entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. And there have been different views around what the future will look like. Just yesterday, one of my shareholders and directors told me, Mitchell, we need to have a post-COVID-19 strategy for, for InterSwitch. And my response was, no, we don't need a post-COVID strategy. We need a strategy that will transcend many seasons. In my view, COVID is just a point in time, but my strategy needs to cover a wider period, okay? So the way I would like to approach is today is to just talk briefly about the topic entrepreneurship no. and business innovation but at the same time recognize the fact that this is about a group of people who have ideas and they want to share their ideas and they want to make a pitch so i'm hoping that in the course of this discussion they will pick one or two lessons that they will find relevant to them today based on where they are with their business ideas and innovations and hopefully as they become more successful they can see how to transcend from being a small startup to a more mature business so i'm trying very hard this time around to ensure that i do not end up addressing you all like i was talking to an audience with businesses that are 20 30 40 years old now when we talk about entrepreneurship there are many definitions out there, um, and I'm sure you all must have seen all sorts of definitions, but there's one that I think is very relevant to the context we are in, and honestly, the context we are in, I'm talking about Nigeria, especially, and the challenges that entrepreneurs face. And that definition is from a professor of Harvard Business School, Howard Stevenson, that basically said, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regards to resources currently controlled. The way I like to see that is, 
there's a problem to be solved. I've identified that problem. I've sized it. It is big, but alas, I do not have the resources to go about it today. And this is very relevant for the kind of activities we are having today. A lot of you are trying to make this pitch in the hope that somehow you get some of the resources you need to take this idea forward. So if you do not have the resources today, you are in perfect company because true entrepreneurs have this idea, they've seen the opportunity, but they don't have the resources within their control to execute on these ideas that they have. Now, when it comes to innovation, again, there are many definitions out there. But one that resonates with me is actually a very simple dictionary definition that describes innovation as the process of translating an idea or invention into a good or service that creates value for which customers will pay. The key word here is value for which customers will pay. When I talk to entrepreneurs, I tell them, nobody really cares if you want to be rich. So when you say, I'm doing this thing because I want to be wealthy, nobody cares. People only care about the challenge that they have that you are trying to solve. People only care about the value that you are creating for them. And for that reason, if they perceive you are solving a challenge for them, they are willing to pay you for that. And for it to be a proper innovation, it is that's three things you need to look out for. One, it should be something you can replicate at an economical cost, meaning it is not a sound innovation if you come up with something that nobody can afford. It is not sound innovation if you come up with something that cannot be replicated. Second point is you need to be satisfying a specific need. It, this, this to me is a very important lesson that entrepreneurs must learn as they innovate. Within my company, I ask the question every time, this idea that you have, what problem are you trying to solve with it? And who are you solving that problem for? And is that person willing to pay you? And if they are willing to pay you, at what price? The point I want to drop here is that as entrepreneurs with an idea, you should have a sense for how much people are going to pay even before you start the process. It doesn't make sense to create something that nobody can afford. And what people can afford varies from country to country. There are many things you can create in Nigeria that our people cannot afford, but you do the same thing in some developed countries with high GDP, they can easily afford it. So your innovation has to be in tune with the environment in which you are solving that particular challenge for. And of course, when you think about innovation, you need to think about the processes that will lead you to creating that value that you want customers to pay for. So don't just think in isolation of the product, but think also of the processes to turn that product into something tangible that people can pay for. Now, the good news is that if you are a Nigerian, listening to me, and you operate within Nigeria, you are in great company. Recently, there was this ranking by the Economist around entrepreneurial activity. And I did hear this Makrewani talk about this once, and I basically asked him for, for the source data, which he shared with me. So what you are seeing now is exactly what he has sent to me. And the message here is that in 2018, Nigeria was reported to have had the second highest number of entrepreneurs, roughly 37.5% of the population. By 2020, we have moved to number one. What that basically means is that Nigeria has lots of challenges, true, but Nigeria also has lots of people 
entrepreneurs like you and I that are trying to address these challenges. Okay? Now, let us unpack this a bit. So the way I would like to look at this is to look at things from five buckets. The first bucket I'd like to talk about is what problems are you trying to solve? The second bucket is how are you going to how are you going about solving these problems or challenges that you have selected. The third one is a statement I'd like to make that money or capital is necessary but not sufficient. A few years ago, Interswift created a $10 million growth fund. And the plan was to give monies to entrepreneurs like yourselves that have great ideas that we felt we should back. We did two investments. After those two investments, I basically went back to the board and said, let's shut down this fund. Because I began to see things that I did not know. I thought money was the reason a lot of entrepreneurs were not successful. I later realized that money may be one part, but it's not the only one. So today I'd like to talk about that when we get to that particular um, bucket. The fourth thing I'd like to drop with you is what is your business model? And lastly, how will you create value? So as you are making your pitch today, it is important that you begin to have these five things at the back of your mind. What problem are you trying to solve? How are you going about solving this problem? Is money really all you need? Or is there something else you need? What is your secret for making money? What is your business model? And how are you going to create that value? Let's start with the very first one. Incidentally, I had just spoken to Hereta when she uh, spoke earlier, but I remember her say something about entrepreneurs want to change the world. So there are two schools of thought here. One school says great companies start because the founders want to change the world, not because they want to make money. Then somebody else has said, not every entrepreneur can change the world. So the question for you is, in this pitch you are making today, what is really driving you? Is it the desire to make money and be comfortable? Or is it the desire to actually pick a genuine problem and solve that problem? I'm not going to be on the panel deciding what uh, talking about what your ideas are and how good they are. But if I was to be on the panel, one of the things I'd be looking at for is what is the driving force for what you're trying to do? Like I said before, if you want to make money, nobody cares. People who make money solve the problem and people rewarded them by patronizing them. And that's how the money came about. So one of the first things you must ask yourself today is, Am I doing this because I want to make money? Or am I doing this because I've seen a challenge in my society, in my community, that I want to solve? And this challenge is big, and therefore it is worth solving. And in trying to solve it, I have a model that can easily be replicated time and time again, and can be done at an economic value. How are you going about solving these challenges? So what kind of entrepreneur are you? I come across a lot of people who do all sorts of things under the name of entrepreneurship. Um, there are different ways these people have been described. So what I'd like you to quickly do is take a look at the slide on your screen, some of them are very obvious. And ask yourself, where do you belong? I'll give you one example. Do good premier. I have a lot of friends who really care about 
the fact that a lot of people in our community do not have enough food to eat. And so from time to time, they rally around themselves, family and friends, and they raise money to provide food for people to eat. And every time they do this, they feel good about what they have done. But guess what? One week after they are gone, those people are hungry again. And so the process starts, oh, can you please give me some money? So they just assume, because the intention is good, there's always a good Samaritan there that always give them money to carry on these things. That is one approach. Another approach is to say, I'm an entrepreneur, I want to do good, but I need to be able to generate enough money to be able to do good. Therefore, I'm going to get into farming. And as a deliberate policy, my CSR policy will be 5%, 10% of any goods I produce will be sold for almost nothing to people who live in vulnerable communities. But guess what? That system is sustainable because the 95% that I'm selling to those who really have a product that can afford it can fund the 5% I want to give away for free. This is also a do good entrepreneur, but guess what? Using a slightly different business model. So one of the things we'll be talking about is what kind of entrepreneur are you? And guess what? You can be any one of them. There's no right or wrong one, but how you design sustainability into what you're trying to do is also very important. So as you think about the ideas that are going to be putting forward today, ask yourself, what kind of entrepreneur am I? And how am I designing sustainability into what I'm putting forward? And in looking at sustainability, you also need to look at the environment you are in. We are having COVID-19. The airline industry is severely challenged. If you are in the film cinema business, Nobody's going out to watch movies. They're watching movies indoors now using Netflix. But guess what? People are rushing to supermarkets, to the market, to pharmacies, to get things. In this season, where things are tough, certain industries appear to be booming. So what problem are you trying to solve in an African or Nigerian context? Are you solving a problem that is physiological? Food? Sleep? Are you solving safety? Is it an issue of love and belonging? Is it of esteem? Or is it of self-actualization? So in looking at sustainability, and the ability of people to pay, you need to think about the GDP of your country and what people have as disposable income and where they're putting that money into. Or if you're looking for a premium segment, you need to ask yourself who in that premium segment and why should they trust my solution given the fact that there could be other solutions out there. So going back to the fund that we raised, I went back to the board and I told the board we need to sunset it because I wasn't convinced that a lot of opportunities we are seeing and the problems we were trying to solve were things that were sustainable. So is money all that you need? There are different forms of capital that entrepreneurs think about. But most times they think about financial capital. Financial capital is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Talent is a very big challenge in Nigeria. And that is why you have the lives of Labour's Business School trying to improve knowledge, intellectual capacity. Beyond money, you need people with the right skill sets to get job done. 
So don't focus only on how do I get the money, but just ask yourself, once I get this money, do I have the team in place? Do I have the processes that will help me convert these ideas into something that people will want? So the question is, while money is important, it is not all that entrepreneurs need. You need contacts. You need assets, access to resources. You need access to certain facilities that your money cannot get you, but they are critical to your success. So the message here is have a total view of what you need to embark on this venture that you're getting into. What is your business model? Everybody knows about the business model canvas. We have applied it. In some cases, we have seen phenomenal success. We've also applied it. And in such cases, we have seen phenomenal failures. So knowing the business model canvas, perhaps, is not all that you need to know when you think about business model. And I'd just like to drop a few things here for your benefit. One, the way I look at business model is it is your secret for making money. I repeat, it is your secret for making money. Now, because it is your secret, ask yourself, what is that thing you know about your business? What is that insight you have about the problem you are trying to solve that no one else knows? I'll give an example. When you ask people, what is InterSwitch? They tell you InterSwitch is a payment company. No, we are not. We are a technology business that saw a problem in payments and we went after that problem. We solved that problem in a way that consumers appreciated and they rewarded us with their business. And the insight we had was critical at that point in time. At the point interest we started trying to solve this problem, everybody was talking about a cashless society. And we said, no, this society is not about cashless. The problem is not cashlessness. The problem is having access to cash. And so we came up with the idea of ATMs to give you cash just in time. We did not advertise it, the market went for it, and the market rewarded us. Today, the market is asking for something else. If we are a payment business, we'll have no business in healthcare. But there are big problems in healthcare that must be disrupted and solved. And technology can be used. So because of that, InterSwitch acquired a company in health tech called Eclat a few years ago, about sometime last year actually. There are problems to solve in transportation in Lagos State. The traffic situation is not sustainable. You do not have, we cannot tell people do not use your cars. Meanwhile, we don't have trains that are working. So, how can we solve the challenge of transportation in Lagos? Is it using Zoom and backing it with some government policies? Is it using technology in a slightly different model or what? So once you understand your DNA, then your biggest model begins to make sense to you. So if you take the example of the Titanic, I'm sure you all heard of that story, that was destroyed. The view was that they saw the tip of the iceberg. But you and I know that ice floats on water. And so the tip of an iceberg should easily float if it encounters um, a big ship like the Titanic. So 
Why was the Titanic unable to just push the ice? Because what was on the surface is not what is underneath. What destroyed the Titanic was not what was on the surface, but what the Titanic did not see the big ice inside the water was what destroyed the ship. That big ice that nobody sees is where your business model should be. And your business model must bring everything you see on this business of metal canvas into a coherent form that makes it difficult to dismantle. And that becomes your secret. Okay? So when you think about your business model, if your business model is something everybody knows, everybody understands, and everybody is trying to do, you can only compete on the basis of one thing, which is price. And that is not sustainable. Which now takes me to how you create value. Yesterday, my son, who is in A-levels, by the way, sent me something on Instagram of a video about some gentleman who was talking about how to excel in business. And the gentleman basically said, if you can make your product cheap, I'm making the best in terms of the solution, and you are very fast at delivery, you have a winner. So the mindset is cheapest product, best solution, fastest delivery, you are a winner. That works when you are just starting your business. But as your business gets mature, you have to move away from those three things because by design, you cannot compete. Whether you like it or not, as you get bigger, your speed slows down. There's always one startup that will do things faster and better than you. They don't have a chief risk officer who must sign off first. They don't have a CFO who is questioning your budget. They don't have a process that says two, three, four departments must sign off before we can go live. So as you get bigger, your structure and size slows you down. Therefore, speed of delivery cannot be a way to compete. What is the lesson here? What I'm trying to bring out is that as you are planning your business now, recognize that sooner than later, you have to move away from cheapest, best, fastest, to something else. Cheapest product has to give way to operational excellence. Best solution has to give way to product leadership. And fastest delivery speed has to give way to customer intimacy. And this is what business schools call the three value disciplines. If you want to create value, you have to think in these three buckets. Operational excellence, product leadership, customer intimacy. There is no law that says you cannot start from this level, even for a startup. So my advice to you is begin to embed practices of operational excellence, product leadership, and customer intimacy. Now, most business schools will tell you you cannot do all three simultaneously. They will tell you that you need to excel in one and do well in the other two. But while I see the logic, my experience tells me that depending on the kind of industry you're in, you may have to look for ways to be excellent in all three. If you focus on customer intimacy and operational excellence is not up to par, all you'll be do doing is, is apologizing to customers and they'll get tired of you. Why is it that when Apple wants to launch a product, people start anticipating it? They wait, they don't buy other products. And when Apple comes out, it is very expensive. 
that people buy it. And when you compare feature for feature with other devices out there, it's not necessarily better. Why? They have designed customer intimacy as one area that they excel at. So as startups, I want to encourage you that although wisdom says you are early stage, but I encourage you to right from now, begin to think about operational excellence, product leadership, and customer intimacy. And for those of you, for those of you who have read some books, like from good to great, and so on and so forth, there's this idea of the tyranny of the all and the genius of the end. And what they have found is that great companies are those companies that learn how to do A and B, and not necessarily A or B. For you to excel as a business, you have to look for a way to achieve a balance between all the three areas that help to create value. By way of rounding up, I would like to say quickly that there are a few things you must guard against. One of them is what I've called the activity trap. What I've seen most times when I engage with entrepreneurs who have done stuff for many months or years, I begin to see a trend. The trend I see is one where they are just doing things and they forget the reason why they started in the first place. And that is what some people have called the activity trap. Getting so involved in your day-to-day -day activities that you forgot the reason why you started doing those things in the first place. It's like climbing a ladder, you get to the top, only to discover that you place the ladder on the wrong wall. You have to come down, move the ladder to the correct wall, and start all over again. So be conscious of not being caught in an activity trap. Always ask yourself, why, am I, why did I start off with this journey? Why am I doing it? Am I still true to the course? I'd like to talk about COVID-19 by way of rounding up. This is my last slide, or second to last slide, by the way. I've been asked questions time and time and time again that what will the world be like post-COVID-19? And my response has not been very popular, but I'm going to say it. The world will go back to normal. Now, some people have put new normal. These are people who are just trying to hedge. So it's not be said that they said it should be normal. So they put new in front of it. Ask them what is new. In my view, normal is normal. And let me explain. Today, we are having this conversation with via Zoom. Zoom was there before COVID-19. Microsoft Teams was there before COVID-19. But today, we are forced to interact this way. My question to you and to LBS is this. Assuming there was no COVID-19, and we had to make this pitch, will we do it using Zoom? Or will we all gather at the Lagos Business School and have our session and interact face to face? I'm a student of science. Physics tells me that a body will remain in a state of rest unless an external force acts on it. And once it starts moving, it will keep moving unless something impedes it also. So let's use that to analyze COVID-19. When the lockdown is stopped, everybody's gonna rush out. The cinemas are going to open. The restaurants are going to open up. Those of us who have been sitting indoors, who are tired of sitting indoors, we're going to rush out. We're going to meet friends. In less than a month, we'll forget about COVID-19. We'll drop our mask. Pandemics have been happening. There have been all sorts of flus. And people have used masks. After the flus end, what happens to the mask? It goes away. 
airlines are going to come back tourism is going to boom why because no most countries cannot afford to allow the airline industry to perish dubai needs emirates to bring people to dubai all those hotels in dubai have staff they need patronage they will crash prices they will create certain deals to entice you and I, and you and I will fall for it and will go for it. What am I trying to say? Never plan your business model or strategy around times. Plan them around seasons. Seasons are the things that keep happening. Summer will always happen. If there's no summer this year because of COVID-19, there'll be summer next year. Children are gonna go back to school. Not every child can afford to be trained remotely. And education has to be universal. So what does COVID-19 do for you and I? It teaches us how to look at traps and triggers. Every business must design for season, but recognize times. Times create opportunities for traps and triggers. But understand that a trigger that has been created may not be sustainable. I'll give an example. If you run a pharmacy business, suddenly all of your money is being put into buying sanitizers and face masks. Because that is what is in demand. People will come to your shop now and ask for paracetamol you don't have because all the money is about into sanitizers and face masks. And you're making lots of money. But guess what? It's for a brief period of time. Is the short trigger. After that trigger, things go back to normal, and people will still ask you for paracetamol. And you need to go back to paracetamol. And the margins of paracetamol at that point in time will not be as huge as the margins you made from sanitizers. And people will never want to hear sanitizers anymore because those who overpaid you during COVID 19 are now upset because they realize they overpaid you. They never want to hear sanitizers anymore. So for you, as business is making a pitch today, ask yourself, I hope you are not focusing on a trap or a trigger that COVID-19 has created and trying to use that as your business model. Anything that started with COVID-19 will end with COVID-19. It's not sustainable. Build your business around seasons and things that will be replicated and will continue to guarantee you steady revenue streams Yes, people will change, consumer behavior will change, patterns will change, but seasons will always be there. And as each season comes, recognize the patterns, the traps and the triggers, the changes that continue to grow your business. Finally, this came from one of my colleagues, a quote by this gentleman, an ounce of action is worth a ton of theory. Stop overanalyzing. Get out there and get stuff done. But then, facts will always change. And there's a very popular quote I like to end my slides with. It's me telling you everything I've told you is Mitchell's view. You still have a duty to look at your business and do what is ideal for your business. Many years ago, Sir John Mena Keynes made some statements and a few months or so later, he changed them and he was challenged by the pressmen. And his response to them was, when events change, I change my mind, what do you do? When the facts change, I change my mind, what do you do, sir? When my information changes, I alter my conclusions. Today, I have told you that post-COVID, the world will go back to normal. I may be wrong, but I may be right. Whether I'm right or wrong, your decision remains your decision. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mitchell. I think that was a very powerful um, keynote with loads of information for entrepreneurs. Um, so you've mentioned 
that every entrepreneur must think about three key things, affordability, availability, and sustainability. No point coming up with, first and foremost, the solution driven. Indeed, you are very right there, and it's something that I've reiterated very much to my students in class, which is the fact that um, statistics have shown that the number one reason why many businesses fail is because they are not purpose driven. They are not trying to solve any particular problem. So I was happy to hear you uh, reiterate that that point. And affordability is key. You must know who your target market is and what they can afford, as you've rightly said. And I would also, I mean, I think you also alluded to that availability. Okay, what I what what resources are used? Are they easily available? And then sustainability. Now, if the problem you're solving is um, really relevant to the public, then they'll be willing to pay for it, and therefore you have a sustainable um, market because people everybody who has a problem is looking for a solution and if your solution is appropriate they will go for you and i think you mentioned one key thing that i think they should keep in mind or another key thing i think they should keep in mind also which is that money is necessary but not sufficient it is a myth we really have to break and and all over the world we see governments make that mistake of thinking that we will propel entrepreneurship by pushing money to smes Training comes before money funding, and I'm happy you, you, you spoke about that. So that's probably why you had to shut down the fund for entrepreneurs when you realized that funding didn't make it happen. You need training, you need to learn the skills. And here again, we see our indigenous um, background, our indigenous method, principles of entrepreneurship, sorry, apprenticeship, which trains people before they are settled to start their business, showing indigenous wisdom. So thank you so much, uh, Mitchell. There's so much to take away from everything you've said. And um, I like the way you also ended, okay? When facts change, I change my mind. So we all have to be on the lookout for what the reality is because we all thought COVID was going to be a fluke. Now we're seeing that it's going to be a marathon. Now, how long that marathon will be, we don't know. All we know is that historically, we've been told that pandemics last between 500 to 800 days, which is an average of two years, if a year is 365 days. So we don't know what it's going to be like, but... We're, 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 we're looking out and um, having scenarios to, to planning scenarios to help ensure that um, we know how to react based on what plays out. But most importantly, as you rightly said, for entrepreneurs to survive now, they need to key into um, what solution they can provide now, what problem they can now solve. Right, so a couple of questions were popping up as you were speaking. Um, I will quickly... Um, ask you a couple of them. We don't have too much time before we move on to the next um, session. So the first session, the first question is coming from Ibadi and she says, glad to be here. Is it really a good thing that we have the highest percentage of our population as entrepreneurs? If it is, what should, what should would be entrepreneurs do? Do you want to answer that on in continuation? She says, what would be, what should, would be entrepreneurs do to guarantee sustainability and build skill. Mitchell, over to you. So typically, I want to encourage you to Google up the dark continents. There's a picture you're going to see. And it's a picture taken from outer space that shows the world. And it was called, Africa is called the dark continent, OK? And the first time I saw that picture, I said, these people have come again. Because when I looked up north, to the left hand side, towards where Canada was, I saw a lot of dark spaces. So there are areas in Canada where nobody really stays because of weather conditions. But we call them weather conditions. And when you come to Africa, where we have darkness too, what conditions do you call them? Now, Canada is trying to woo people to come to Canada. What are we trying to do here? So my response to you is Africa has lots of challenges. These challenges are opportunities. We don't have enough jobs. Therefore, if you don't want to sit in one place and die of hunger, you'll be seeking opportunities. So there's a direct correlation between the challenges we have and the number of entrepreneurs that we have. So it's actually a good thing that we have people who are coming out trying to solve problems. I know of people who resign from jobs as salespeople because they're not making sales for the company that was paying them money monthly. Their conscience 
do not allow them to continue to stay there. They went to something else on their own, and guess what? They are thriving. So the fact that we have lots of challenges is an opportunity for people like you and I who are entrepreneurs. I left Slumberge to come back to Nigeria. I could have stayed in Europe. And I came back here, saw an opportunity, and we've gone after solving a particular problem. I will still see a lot of them. Okay? So the opportunity is there. The population is high. The jobs are not there. We all cannot employ for jobs. So it's a good thing that we have challenges that we can solve. The question is how we're solving them. All right, thank you, Mitchell. So another question from Ade Ani Adeleke says, as a startup, how do you offer the cheapest product or service to the market with no external funding and low cash? This startup is currently bootstrapping. In fact, between you and I, you know, I told you that slide was something my son sent to me. I did not agree with it, but I do want to tell him, no, you have to create expensive products because that's not the right answer. And that is why I moved him into things like operational efficiency. You see, the reason why some of us will pay so much for a bottle of a particular kind of drink, whereas the same drink packaged differently, will be half that cost. And there's no difference. It's because of some other things they've done to it. So I'm not by any means saying you must produce at the cheapest. I don't believe in producing at the cheapest. I, be, I believe in producing what is value. Let your mind be more on value than cheap. Let me give you an example. We talked about uh, sanitizers. Sanitizers that were being sold for what of sake of argument, 100, 200, 1,000 naira before, is not going for 4,000. Did the cost of production quadruple? No. Somebody has perceived that the value that you have not placed on sanitizers is high. And so they have moved their money up. So the focus on that thing you are creating, what value is your customer placing on it? I tell my guys in the office, if you want to create a product, start by telling me how much the customer is going to pay. And then we'll walk back to see if we can produce at that price and still make money. There's no point producing something that your customers cannot afford. And there's no point producing something that the customer is willing to pay a lot for and you don't charge appropriately for it. You are destroying value for yourself. So cheapest is not my, my so it's not what I preach. Most expensive is not what I preach. It is finding that sweet spot of what your customer is willing to pay for the problem you are trying to solve. Not every problem must be solved. If you are trying to solve a problem, I can only solve that a price that those benefiting from it cannot pay, then there's no point trying to solve that problem. You are going to kill your business. Okay. All right, so um, next question, or sorry, I should say second to the last, so we can move to the next item. It says, I really enjoy the keynote address. Very instructive and inspiring. It may be correct to assume that things will return to normal in the long haul post-COVID-19, but not in the near term, in my view, on account of the distortions that the pandemic has engendered globally. Will he be kind to speak to this and reconcile these two time periods. This is from Jacob Erabo. Okay, so when we say normal, nobody has defined that normal should be one year or two years. So we all give our views based on not a, what will happen one month after COVID-19, after the lockdown. But let me ask you a question. Eh? Just take a look at China. China was the first to go down because of COVID-19. China was the first to come back up because of COVID-19. What are we seeing in China? As soon as China came back up, everybody was producing. China wanted to solve the problem of COVID-19 for the world. They started producing masks, everything that they know people will need. How long did it take them for their factories to reopen? 
schools are going back. How long did it take for schools to reopen? Okay. So when we talk about this, I, I, I cannot give you a response based on what happened in the first one month, second month. I don't know that. I don't have a crystal ball in front of me. But I do know that in terms of intent, every government will recognize that because of COVID-19, people have lost their jobs. It's a big problem. How can we help companies to get people back into employment? The Central Bank of Nigeria has come out to tell banks, please do not retrench. The tax authorities are saying, if you do not retrain staff, we will give you a discount on your PE, on your tax. Why? And it's been said in the midst of COVID-19, that no way to be over. Because they know if people lose their jobs, the impact overall on the economy will be terrible. If PE is reduced, the tax authorities will not make enough money. And they don't make enough money, a lot of the social amenities we expect to see. So everybody, government, wants the world to go back to normal. I want to get back to work. My, my sons, my daughter, they're all missing their, their colleagues in school. They want to go back to school. When the lockdown in Lagos was reduced, we took a position in interest rate that our staff should still stay home for one week. Let us watch the situation. Guess what? Some staff appeared at the office. We have to tell them, go back home. Nobody should resume. Why? Everybody wants to get back to normal. Okay, Mitchell, thank you so very much. That has been enlightening. Let me just add that um, in China, people are going back to school with a difference, okay? All the children, I have pictures of all the children in the class with both face masks and face shields. So, and actually China is gradually shutting back down again because the, the infection rates are rising again, okay? So you are right. When facts, new facts emerge, we modify accordingly. This, I tell you, is something that, um, I don't know, yes, there have been other pandemics, but it looks like every pandemic has its peculiarities, and we do have to keep watching. We do have to keep watching. Having said that, you want to say something, Mitchell? Yeah, just a quick one on that. Okay. Because COVID is very clear what it means. Post, this is assuming COVID has gone. If my country decides that COVID has gone, it has not gone, that is an error in judgment. And that is why I said industry staff stay at home. This decision by government is a government decision looking at all the facts government has and their role as government. As the CEO of a company, I also have to look at my own facts and take my own decisions. And my decision was Interest staff stay at home. Now, I, you need to go buy stuff to eat, fine. Now, if China opened their schools, they could have opened it so that things can get back to normal. And they are saying, why are you going back to school? Still keep putting your mask because the threat is not gone completely. So, when I talk about post COVID, I'm not talking about a post COVID that is temporary when the COVID is back again. We need to clear this disease. If it takes two years, then my definition of post-COVID is two years after COVID has gone. I'm just saying when COVID goes away, everything we have right now that has enabled us to stay at home, those things were there before COVID. Nothing that is enabling us to live our lives the way we're living it now, with nothing that was created because of COVID. It was there before we did not use it. Now, COVID has forced us to use it. Post-COVID, the question is, will you continue to use it the way it is now, or will you go back to normal? Now, my view is we'll go back to normal. So people have added new normal. It's OK. When the facts change, we'll address it at that point in time. OK? OK. Right. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, Mitchell. Thank you so much. I hope you will hang around and not leave. Um, because next, I'm going to, I'm going to um, do a bit of a switch. The next thing on the agenda right now is to go from the, well, okay, so we're still on point. It's actually 12 o'clock. And um, 
this is when the question and answer session is meant to end. So great. Now the next on the agenda is the growth plan entrepreneurship pitch where the contestants are supposed to pitch. But I think that a natural flow from your discussion would be to have the panelists um, speak to this issue of building and sustaining successful uh, businesses during the COVID period. So I'm going to do a slight switch. I'm going to go, I'm going to try to bring the panelists forward. I hope they're, they're ready. Um, and um, we will try to, we will, we will try to have that discussion and then have the um, entrepreneurs pitch afterwards. Right. So with me today, our panelists, uh, our three panelists who will be speaking to us um, from their various perspectives um, about what they think uh, entrepreneurs need to have in place to ensure that um, they can continue to survive during this period and thrive in spite of the several changes. So the first of the panelists with us today is Paul Orajaka. Paul is the Chief Executive Officer of Alden Limited. He holds a Master's in Public Administration from Harvard Kennedy School of Government and an Executive Master's an MBA from the Lagos Business School. He is a doctoral research associate with Henley Business School in the University of Reading in the UK. And um, he has obtained his MSc in Business and Management Research from the same institution. He's an alumnus of the London Business School, ESA Business School in Barcelona, and the University of Wisconsin in the USA. So even though Paul is in business, you can see that he's also uh, in love with education. So, um, so Paul will be speaking to us um, from his perspective about what he's doing in his own business and advising the rest of entrepreneurs as to what they need to do. Um, we also have with us um, Stephanie Obi. Stephanie is a pioneer in knowledge technology industry in Africa. She has spent the last four years creating wealth opportunities for Africans through her signature method, the perfect online course. She also runs an agency which has produced online courses for successful African business leaders, um, including Ibuku Awoshika, Tara Feladrotoye, and Osai Alele. With a growing online community of over 50,000, Stephanie has demonstrable expertise in marketing to African entrepreneurs, training them at scale, and growing engaged online communities. Dubbed the queen of online courses, she is the founder of Train Quarters, a knowledge tech platform powering online courses for Africans by Africans. She's a first class graduate of computer science, an alumna of the Lagos Business School MBA program, and the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Knowledge is the New Gold. So Stephanie has a lot of expertise in the, the area of entrepreneurship and online training, and she will also be sharing her perspective. Next, we have the third panelist is Mr. Richmond Ezenwa Okafo. Richmond holds a degree in electrical and electronics engineering from the University of Benin, Nigeria, and an MBA from Lagos Business School. He also holds certifications in finance for non-finance managers, advanced engineering systems, uh, data control Dublin in, from Dublin, Ireland, Wave Wireless Partner Training, um, Wave Wireless Saras, Sarasota, Florida, and Supply and Stores Management. He is currently a doctoral candidate at Monarch University in Switzerland. Richmond worked for 10 years as co-founder and CEO at Systems Plus Limited, an IT solutions provider and licensed internet service provider he is currently the co-founder and director of DigiPlus Limited, a telemetry and SCADA solution service provider that has implemented projects for banks, telcos, hospitals, etc. He is also the founder and chairman of CleanMax Industries Limited, a manufacturer of household cleaning products, which means he's cleaning out right now. He is the grant awardee of the Growth and Employment um, Project. Right, so. Richmond will also be sharing his perspective with us on how businesses can survive and thrive during COVID-19. So I'm going to start with um, uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, ladies first. Stephanie, can you tell us in your opinion, 
what you think entrepreneurs should be doing right now. Well, tell us what you've done with your business. Share with us what you've done with your business and tell us what you think entrepreneurs should be doing right now in about five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here and thank you for having me. So just to give you some, some background, she's already um, shared my bio, but let me explain. So what I've been doing is that I take um, any knowledge that I have and I turn it into a product that can be sold online. All right. So at first, when we started, it was like this new thing that I was just doing. Oh, you can sell online. You can have a business online. But with the lockdown, it became more imperative for more business owners to create products that they could deliver and sell online. So in a, for a lot of businesses, they have physical products like makeup or phones or you know, candles that they can sell with you know, delivery agents. But what I was t t telling people is that you can actually sell your intellectual property. So all of us have some form of IP that can be packaged into a product, for instance, an online course, and it can be delivered online. What we found is that when in the, with COVID and the lockdown, there were new businesses that you know, arose. So for example, parents were on lockdown with their children all at home, <laughs> and some parents started shouting all the time. One of my clients launched an online course teaching parents how to stop shouting at their children. And she, she earned money. <laughs> People actually paid for, <laughs> for how to teach them how to stop shouting. And so you will hear so many stories of the most ridiculous things that people are paying for, but they are paying for it because it's now solving real problems. Another one is how to homeschool. P children now have to um, learn at home with, uh, with their phones or with the internet. Some parents are like, I can't deal with this. But there are some other parents who have been doing this for a long time. They have that IP. They have that knowledge. They turned it into an online course. And they started teaching people how to sell online. And the most beautiful part of this is that when you turn your knowledge into a product, such as an online course, you can sell it to Nigerians. You can sell it to Ghanaians. You can sell it to people in Australia. You can sell it to people in Zimbabwe, all across the world. So what? Um, what I find is that even though it's unfortunate that people are dying because of the, the, um, the illness or the pandemic, it's actually an area of opportunity because businesses are beginning to see that, oh, oh, I can do business on a global level. Now you will see some businesses that have been doing trainings physically, they only wait for people to walk in through their doors. Now, they're now saying, okay, this training that we've been doing indoors, we've been doing it to only our local community. How can we scale it up? How can we leverage on technology to, to reach more people? And this thing has been there since, but sometimes until you have a, an, a, a, a crisis like this, it forces you to stop and to look at your business and see where, where are the opportunities that we have been missing out on? What are the things that we can do differently? And one thing that, I, that is becoming clear is that the online education market is, is an untapped market in Africa. Overseas, in the global market, it is worth over $100 billion. But in Africa, we haven't even started because we used to think that, oh, Africa is not ready for it. But if you look at what's going on now, everybody is doing Zoom. Everybody's doing live videos. Everybody's doing, everybody's now teaching online. And so there's an emergence of a new, a new industry, literally, because people are now learning how to learn online, learning how to teach online. And they're going to start packaging their knowledge into products. So I think it's a great time because it's costing all of us to innovate. All right. Thank you, um, Stephanie. So um, let's hear from Paul Radjaka what he thinks entrepreneurs, what he has done, what you've done with your business and what you think entrepreneurs should be looking to do. You need to unmute yourself, Paul. Paul, you're on mute. All right. So you can hear me now? Yes, I can hear All you, right. Paul. Thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be among the panelists discussing about the challenges SMEs face during this period. As you understand, we sell toys and um, this has also brought up a new dimension of business where we had to like start tilting a lot into our online business. Before the COVID era, we had the, the online and the offline business. And these guys were actually working more like competitors and rivals where they tried to undo themselves and make more money between, for the company. But surprisingly, 
the online guys have actually had to play cash up. But during the COVID period, the table switched because we found out that the online became too busy and we had to just change our strategy by moving many of the staff who were offline to start working online. And then we realized something that um, it, was, it became a training process for us. If we had known earlier that this would be how the table would swing, we would have probably been giving the offline guys some kind of training. But here yeah, we had to start afresh, teaching them how to go on with the online business. And it was so good when we had the partial lockdown because even though they were, the whole market was short, we were still like the number one go-to place when it comes to people coming to buy toys. But then when the government insisted on the complete and total shutdown, they regarded toy as non-essential product. So our delivery guys were having challenges fulfilling a couple of the others. So but we're glad that now that the government had actually given some, some, um, some relaxation to the lockdown, even up to this time, since the government said we're going to open business on 4th of May, we just opened our online portal and the others were just crazy, you know? And since we opened 4th of May, we've still been battling how to fulfill the order. So it's an opportunity that came for us in disguise because a lot of people are so uncomfortable coming to the conventional market, you know, to buy these toys. So all they do is from the comfort of their home, they are now placing orders. So for us as a business, one of the key learning points is that we had to start making more resources, uh, putting more resources into our online advert advertising making sure that we're reaching out to more customers. And it's been amazing how the, the, the scope and the, the wide range of customers we're getting now, like never before. You know, some states are still like total lockdown and they toy for their kids and we're sending these things through GIG, um, FedEx and all the rest. So I think for us, this COVID has shown us that we can actually focus on our online business and turn it around to become more profitable than what we're doing before prior to COVID of, on our offline business. Thank you so much, Paul. So I guess what you're saying now is that companies should look out for new opportunities, not to be too fixated on their prior um, business models, but may, to see whether this situation has actually opened up a new business model. And I can tell you that your, what you're saying is actually, has actually been the case for the Lagos Business School, where we've had over 15,000 participants in the space of one month, which, has, which is unprecedented, you know, yeah. so... Yeah, you you have a strong point there. Um, Stephanie also made a similar point. Fantastic. So um, Richmond, we will now be with you for you to share with us um, how COVID has impacted on your business and your recommendations for entrepreneurs. Okay, hi. It's great to be here. Um, I'm just going to flip your questions around a bit. I'm going to look at it from a more general perspective, and then I'll offer you what I've done specifically for my business. I think in, a, in general terms, COVID has impacted businesses at several points, at several points. And I'm glad that one of the things that Mitchell talked about is the need for every business to revisit their business model. This is a time for you to go develop a canvas of your business model because it does give you perspective and it enables you to innovate, you know, your current model to one that addresses all the new concerns. Because if you look at COVID, COVID has touched on your business model at several points. One is that your value proposition may no longer be tenable. You may need to address, depending on the business that you do, concerns about hygiene. Your costs clearly would have changed because there's supply chain issues, the issues with the Naira and the dollar rates and all of those things. And supply chain. Mitchell mentioned the fact that the cost of um, hand sanitizer had quadrupled. Uh, he gave the impression that perhaps somebody was trying to, be, to take advantage. But the reality is that supply chain challenges has impacted the costs of delivering those products in some it was in, in some places to an extent of almost 400 percent the original costs okay so covid has touched on several points and the approach every business has got to take has to be holistic 
You've got to look at your business model and look for ways that you can innovate around the constraints that COVID presents. You've got to look at your costs profile. You've got to look for the elements that present a disproportionate impact on your costs. Those are the elements that you need to address squarely. For instance, in our business, traditionally, now I'm talking about my manufacturing business, traditionally the cost of packaging is usually about 35% of the total cost, 35 to 40% of the total cost of the product. But with the advent of COVID, the cost of packaging more than two to 300 percent. So one of the things that we did was we decided that we're going to bundle our products. So instead of selling one unit with the full complements of the packaging, we will bundle two together. One will be a stripped down version of the original product where packaging has been, you know, we've stripped down a bit of the packaging so that we can deliver the product to for almost the original price of two. But then there's been compromise on the packaging. Now, one of the other areas where we were seriously challenged as a business, because we were allowed to operate, we provide an essential product, was in the area of logistics. And it's still a challenge. However, we have found that some of the logistic firms have also been very innovative. They have gotten permits from governments and they do last mile delivery. I mean, we have a depot in Abuja and a depot in a few other key areas, but our depots couldn't function effectively because of the lockdown, for instance, in Abuja. So we had our logistic partners providing last mile service and, and this was truly helpful. So in terms of how you approach COVID, I'd like to use the the analogy of the barber, because as you can see, I don't know how you guys have achieved it. I haven't had a haircut for several weeks, <laughs> but I can see my peers have all have nicely shaven hair, and I'm going to ask them privately how they were able to do this. So I like to use the analogy of the proverbial barber. So the barber, it's no, it's no longer enough that he can cut hair very well, and he has an area you know, an environment that is aesthetically pleasing, nice ambience and all of those things. He's got to also address the concern of hygiene. Because hygiene will be a very, very important, uh, will be a very important proposition to customers. And for a barber to do this, he may have to kit his barbers in the PP4 outfit. That's the only way I'm going to have the confidence level to go back to a barbing shop to cut my hair. But then if the barber takes a look at his business model, he would realize that the PP4 will increase his costs. But he would also realize that because he's addressing the concern, which is the most important concern now of hygiene, he can charge a premium. I traditionally used to cut my hair for between 500 and 1,000. I'm willing to pay 3,000. So it's not all doom and gloom because of COVID. Businesses have got to think of innovative ways to circumvent the constraints that COVID presents. And I think that's the way to go. And just to also touch on the point that Michel mentioned, which I think you, you, you also challenged him on. Yes, COVID may disappear in one, in two years. But habits and dispositions have been changed forever. If you remember terrorism and 9-11, we can't, we live in a post 9-11 environment more than a decade after 9-11. It's going to be similar with COVID. We're going to live in a post COVID environment for at least the next one to two decades, which will mean that hygiene will be a concern of the CEO of a bank. It will no longer be the concern of the janitor. The CEO of the bank will be concerned about the hygiene of his environment 
the safety of his workers and all of those things. The safety of transporting the workers, something you pointed out here in our last meet. These are great opportunities and every business has got to think of how can I address this current concern about hygiene and safety? These are the things that will enjoy, ensure that your business remains here and possibly thrives now or in the post COVID era. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Richmond. Uh, for those of us listening, we have over, we're almost, uh, we have our 361 participants listening. I hope you were able to catch the opportunity that um, Richmond threw out there. He says, you know, we normally cut his hair for between 500 to 1,000 naira. He's ready to pay 3,000 naira to cut his hair if your salon is safe, okay? So that shows you, of course, he doesn't think that an extra 2,000 is too much to pay to save his life. So he's willing to pay a premium. So that's an opportunity there for those who may need to pivot because the truth about the matter is that, you know, if your business, I mean, businesses have been affected in different ways. Some have been affected favorably, like Stephanie has spoken about and Paul, okay? Also, Richmond has been affected favorably because he's the chairman of a, of a, of a, of a company that manufactures cleaning materials. So, of course, demand for his products have gone up astronomically. And so, others have been affected adversely. So, for example, the, the field, the, 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 the cinema owners, the airline uh, people, those into tourism. So the question now is what should they do, okay? Some might need to modify slightly. So for example, Paul is selling now more online. Even LBS is doing more online programs than um, offline programs. Um, and, um, and they'll be fine. Others may need to pivot, okay? So where are the growth areas? Agribusiness, for instance, people won't stop eating, okay? And with agribusiness comes all the things that go along the value chain, um, in processing, packaging, warehousing, distribution, these are all opportunities. So what, where, wh how are you being impacted? Favorably, adversely, and depending on how you've been impacted, impacted, you need to modify to survive. You need to pivot to a new industry. Okay, the fact we're seeing many fashion designers, for instance, who have gone from making fashionable clothing to making face masks and uh, PPEs and other hospital uniforms that are required. Okay, so what changes do we need to make? Right, I'm going to go, since we have some more time, we, the panel session is meant to end at 12.40. I'm going to quickly go around um, the panelists with one more question. So um, Mitchell made a very important point about the fact that he realized the hard way after investing in some startups they felt would, should, uh, would deserve support, that money wasn't, money wasn't necessary, was necessary but not sufficient for entrepreneurial success. So um, let me start with Paul this time. In your opinion, in starting out, because today most of our, some of our panel, most of our panel, our, pitch, our um, contestants are startups. Okay, in your opinion, do you think startups should worry about having money, or is there something else you think should will help business startups succeed and thrive beyond funding? What should, is, is it money that comes first, or what do you think? What do you think the process should be for entrepreneurial success? Well. Paul. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. I've always been an apostle of um, pushing the fact that it's not money that make, that make you a successful businessman. It's always ideas that should come first. If you have the right ideas and mash it up with the right values, certainly the funds to get those things kicked off will always come. So one of the biggest challenges I'll tell people, like for me as a businessman, whatever we've built today came out from a small money of 5,000 naira savings, not something we just came across, but something over the time we built it. So most of the time, you find that ideas should be your primary focus and ideas matched with values where you're actually addressing a need, you're addressing something. Hetty, you can remember in our LBS day, that was never an apostle of value as um, the main focus. But when we started the Unity Door project, whereby we're trying to create value in the lives of young girls proving to them that you could actually be as beautiful as you want to be naturally than copying the white skin dolls. I mean, it changed our business model. It changed our business perspective globally. So I always tell people, the first thing you would find out as a businessman is what opportunity have you been able to conceptualize? And then when you see that opportunity, the next step would be how to commercialize this. And I could tell you that the moment you pitch a good idea to anybody, 
obviously they would be willing to throw in their money. But when you don't pitch that good idea to them, nobody wants to take a bet on you. And also people feel that for me to be successful, I need to go and look for these big funds, have big business plans and big business ideas, and then start big. It never works. You should first be the, the janitor, the cleaner, the boss, the secretary. Just you and your briefcase should be the first set of employees that you could ever engage. So but people get it wrong. They want to come with, oh, this aesthetics of having a wonderful office, a wonderful setup, a wonderful business plan that when they share to people, why it's going to be just invest a hundred million. It doesn't work that way. So I always tell people, never rely on money. Empty pocket makes no one poor. Only empty minds and empty ideas would actually keep you poor. So for me, I would tell everybody, first of all, focus on your ideas, sharpen them as well as, as good as you can so that whoever you sell them to will be willing to stick their money, even when you don't have the resources to kick it up on your own. Thank you, Paul. Right, Richmond. Well, uh, money follows the ideas. Really. Um, if you walk, if you watch this online program called the Shark Tank, you know I think the Shark Tank perhaps is the best um, example I can give for how money follows great ideas, and it's not the other way around. For me, when somebody comes to me with a pitch, if he's focused entirely on the money that he, he requires to do it, I'm always very weary because he will perhaps not be in a position to manage whatever funds he's given. But even if he's oblivious, of what it takes financially to take this idea and run with it. I'm usually very encouraging of those kind of people because they're focused on the idea, you understand? Now, beyond the idea, the other thing I try to look for, which is critical for success, it is great, really, you know, the ability to stay with the challenges until you win. You know, I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs buckle. Because to take an idea from an infant stage and deliver it as a true value proposition, there are several hurdles in between. And you've got to be able to overcome those hurdles to be successful. Your ability to understand the challenges in between the idea and success and the ideas you have to circumvent those challenges are quick critical success factors for me. So if you focus really on the capital and all of those things, I'm usually very suspicious because what will happen with those kind of people is that they will look for where to burn the cash and, you know, and it's never really great for, for the business. So ideas, money goes after great ideas and it's not the other way around. Money goes after great ideas. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Richmond. Right, Stephanie, please. Yes, so one of the things that um, Mr. Michel said earlier is that entrepreneurs, we always start with a, with, a, with, a, with a mission to change the world. And so we are very, we are big thinkers, very passionate. We want to start, you know, change the world. And many times to change the world need a lot of money. And, and sometimes you're blinded by passion that you just keep moving without things stopping to see does anybody want to pay for this thing. So one of the things that I found to be true in my own business is that um, I always now it's, now, it's now like a process, it's a policy. We always have to launch with an MVP. That is a minimum viable product. What can we, how can we test this idea? Before we go and start, you know, dancing around the moon and doing all those plenty of things, how can we test it? And if you, and to test the market, you always have to go to the field and speak to people, understand their problems, and then pitch them a solution and get them to pay. If they pay for a solution, then you have a winning product. And you can then use that as, um, you can then use that as a basis to look for funds or look for investment or to even invest in the business. All right, it always has to be a proof of concept. I now strongly believe that cash is the only true test. If you've gotten somebody to pay for your, for your minimum viable product, then that is the basis upon which it can be scaled. So before you 
you um you know you you go big test your idea all right no matter how passionate you are the second thing i found is that there's nothing new under the sun and you always need to be asking for help all right so and to ask for help you have to nurture relationships you have to have relationships with you know mentors relationship people who you've met in lbs relationship with people who you meet in a, in, a, in a different network somewhere but um my generation specifically millennials <laughs> millennials we especially even when we are you know we are smart or tech savvy we think that we know everything and then we bond relationships too quickly too quickly what i found is that you need people you need people at every different level and when you meet people at different level it's important to nurture those relationships because some 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 people you know they might not be they, they might not have the um, kind of skills that you have they might not be techy but they they are valuable in a different way so if you're not nurturing your relationships you will just realize that you get stuck you know after a while you get stuck or even sometimes you just need someone to speak for you in you know to open a door for you to to um to to encourage you to hold your hands i've literally been in meetings where you know <laughs> i was the youngest person there and i saw some older people who I had a relationship with start speaking for me. And those things, you can't buy it. It's no money. It's a relationship that you have nurtured over the years. And somehow, my generation has missed this thing, but I'm beginning to find it over and over again, that, you know, one thing you have is, one form of capital is people capital. And, and many times, you're investing in these relationships. It's not money you're investing, but you're doing things, and you're, you're, you're investing your time. Those things pay off in the end, in the long run, and they will help you to um, sustain, you know, to go through different phases in your business. So please, especially for the, um, for the people who are contesting, please, I'm begging you, <laughs> not your relationships. You will need that, yes, in addition to money. Can I just add something to what Stephanie has said? Um, one of the key things, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it, Stephanie, is that for you to have a great product, which is that you're able to reconcile your offering with your value proposition. It's a process of iteration and experimentation. No one in their bedroom can design a product that is 100% Value to the to the uh, to the customers or market, you've got to go to the market, get a feedback, and make changes. You no, know, iterate your offering until it truly reconciles with what the market wants. And here's one of the things I find MBAs challenged by. You know, they always want to think through. They want to have it ready. They want to have it hundred percent before they go to market. And it's never really possible to do that because by the time you have it at your own 100%, you will find out what the market really desires is 40%. Mm -hmm. And they would like to do away with 60% and save costs on that. So I think, uh, Stephanie, you raised a really important uh, point there that the process of having a truly great service offering or product offering is a process of isolation and experimentation. And there's, you cannot, and you know what? The software industry has perfected it because they usually release what's called a beta version. Mm -hmm. And they send the beta version out. When you start to use it, they can see where the changes need to be made. They can see where they need to perhaps, you know, remove some features that are not useful. And I think that every business has got to imbibe that approach. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, panelists. You really raised very, very critical points about building a successful business, starting from Paul, who emphasized the importance of value. Now, what is value? Value is to people that is what they consider a solution to their problem or something that helps them achieve <clears throat> a certain goal. So meeting a, solving a problem with a solution or meeting a need Create means it's interpreted as value for the customer. And if you remember what Michelle said, when people perceive value, the more value they perceive, the more they're willing to pay. Just like the value for sanitizers grew and people were eventually willing to pay more for those sanitizers, okay? Um, Richmond also makes the, the, this very strong point about knowing fully well that you must um, 
put the idea first. Money, money chases value, okay? Money chases good ideas. If you have a great idea, people can see what you're trying to achieve. Um, there will be more, and they can see that there's a real, a real need for that. There's a real market for it. They will invest in it. They will invest in that. And also the importance of a feasibility study. So as Stephanie said, start small, think big. Make your minimum viable product, okay? And as which one said, iterate. Go back to the market and show them, okay? Get feedback to refine that initial idea till you come up with what the market is happy with and as a price that they're happy with. And then you're now ready to, to begin to scale, okay? So start small, think big. These look like very simple, commonsensical things, but you'd be very surprised that many people don't keep these things in mind. Of course, the issue of networking, nothing great, as John Maxwell said, was ever done by one person alone, okay? So a single, there's no lone genius that builds a mighty, something that is really great. Great things are built by teams, okay? So there's value in network. You create, you give value to others, others in your network give value to you. So it's a two-way flow, okay? You, of you giving value as well as you receiving value. Okay, so um, Stephanie, you're very right. Millennials forget the importance of nurturing relationships and I'm, I hope they will listen to, to you as you're one of them as you advise all of this. Right, we have three minutes to the time of the pitch. Um, I don't have new questions, but I can just ask one of the questions I had here. Um, it says, my, okay, well, my questions are, please, how do I raise funds for a startup and pay back or maintain the fund or loan? How can I reach larger costs? Well, I think that first question has, well, okay, I don't know if you, I think it has been answered, but just in case any panelists would like to quickly touch on that, how do I reach a larger customer base for a technology product? How do I maintain relevance? Hmm. We have three minutes to answer this question. Should I throw it to, to since it's on technology, should I throw it to Stephanie? Yes, okay. you can quickly answer. All right. So number one, um, in building online communities, you know, in the online world, first of all, people are afraid. And so if you want to sell anything to anybody online, you have to take time to build, to instill confidence and to get people to trust you. So it's a long-term game. So the earlier you can start, the better. Start creating content that will attract your ideal clients and will keep them entertained, educated, and inspired. All right. So you can do this by sending newsletters. You can do this by doing live streams. You can do this by doing... Um, posting on social media, anything you can do to create content consistently that will solve problems for your ideal clients will help. Number two, as you start doing this, what will happen is that you will now have opportunities to partner, all right? You'll be able to partner with platforms, well-built platforms who can invite you to leverage on their platforms. But you have to be doing something first. If you're not doing anything, they, they won't invite you, all right, you see. So when you, first of all, build your platform, build, you start, um, you know, growing your community, speaking to people, solving problems for free online, what will happen is that you become a person of value or a brand of value. And then it will not be easy for people to want to partner with you. And then you can get on other platforms that have more people and they will allow you to work with them. All right, that's partnership on one level. Another level of partnership is to, it's not right thing, is to look for people who are in who are serving your customers and look for how you can offer your service to them. All right. So for example, quick example, Uber, when Uber came, they wanted to, you know, get people to try Uber for the first time. They went to a GTB and they said, look, we're willing to give your, all your customers access to a free, um, a free ride. All right. GTB sent an email to its thousands of users, that people should try Uber. You see, you see how they leverage on GTV's platform. But first and foremost, you have to become, you know, build your brand and then you can now get into partnerships. All right, thank you. So just a quick one on the thing of, anybody wants to talk about the thing of relevance? How do I maintain relevance in a sentence or two? Richmond, you need to unmute. Oh, well, it's simple, really. You've got to continue to offer value because there's no... It's not a relationship. It's a relationship of value exchange. If, you, if you're going to be relevant, you've got to continue to innovate your offering. You know, it's an imperative. You've got to, you know, continue to offer them new value and all of that. This new value can come in so many different ways, you know. Richard talked about intimacy. You've got to think of ways that you can be closer to your customers. Perhaps customization, 
perhaps you're in an IT business, you can think of externalities. How do we get somebody else to pay so that you can enjoy this service that you like so much for free? And you know, IT platforms are very good for that. You can find, I mean, look at uh, Google, for instance. We pay nothing for all the great services that Google offers, but Google has found ways of, you know. So to be relevant, to be continually relevant, means that you've got to continue to be valuable to the client. You've got to continue to innovate your offering and stay relevant. I, I think that's the bottom line. Right, thank you, Richmond. Okay. So um, just to round up, Paul, please take this last question. It says, no doubt the opportunities in Nigeria are huge, but most of it are in the informal sector who do not have access to buy online. How does a business assess this informal sector during COVID-19? Which has predicted, which it has been predicted to last at least eighteen months. Sorry, um, Hetty, could you just take the question? I, I was trying to put on my earpiece at the first okay. the early time. All right. So it says, no doubt, the opportunities in Nigeria are huge, but most of it are in the informal sector, which do not have access to buy online. How does a business assess this informal sector during COVID-19, which has been predicted to last at least 18 months? Okay. <clears throat> well, um, true, like he, he, he rightly said that um, most of these uh, businesses are not, um, uh, are not online in terms of the informal sector. But um, it, it, would, it would amaze you at the number of penetration online businesses has gone in Nigeria. So, so for most of those um, 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 people who want to actually assess the informal sector, what I think you should do is go into those informal sectors where you have the big dealers, the big markets. These guys have tons of people walking into their shops every day in the big major markets. So I think you should partner with these guys who have these um, people who are at the bottom of the pyramids patronizing their businesses. So if you have this kind of collaboration with them, they will be the one who will, on the other, on the, at, at the other end, help you penetrate those lower markets whom you feel are not online in terms of um, getting your businesses to them. So I think this will call for the partnership that we talked about here, the collaboration between you and the other people with whom you think will help your business get to your target market. Great, Paul. Thank you so much. Panelists, you've been all amazing. I think that... Um, the contestants already have received value for deciding to contest because um, right from the keynote speech to the very valuable points that each of you have touched, um, it, there's been a lot of, a lot of learning for, for everybody listening, including the, the contestants for today. Right, so please stay with us um, as we move to the next segment, which is the pitch contest. So we have six contestants with us today. And um, we are going to start, so, the, for, so to judge this contest, we have three, um, three judges. Let me see if I can quickly pull them up. Um, one of them is part of the panelists, uh, is Richmond, who I've already introduced. We have, as one of the judges, um, Glory Ainaya, who is, represent, who is the regional representative for Faster Capital. Glory, you want to say hello? You want to unmute yourself and say hello quickly? Um, okay. Pastor, hello, hello, everyone. Right. Hello. So, yeah, okay. we've heard you. We can, we can hear you, Glory. Okay. All right. So, Faster Capital is located in Dubai, but have several offices worldwide. They focus on IT startups in the mobile web domain and invest in startups at all stages, from idea stage and beyond. Um, and they offer four rounds of funding per year. The current funding round opened in January 25th, January 15th and closes in March 15th, 2020. So, so basically, um, Laurie is representing them and will be offering a, um, she will announce what her offering will be um, when we, oh, Laurie, do you want to share with us what you're, what you're offering uh, the winner of this contest? Yes. Okay. So, um, Faster Capital offers the opportunity to invest between twenty thousand dollars and two million dollars in companies which are accepted into their incubation program. So, 
whoever wins this competition will get fast tracked and will be uh, introduced into into the faster capital network. And if they are successful, then they stand to get investment of up to two million dollars. Fantastic. Now the third judge we have with us is Christian Wilson. She is the vice president for West Africa for Double Feather Partners. Hi, Christine. Hi. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Okay, so um, Kristen, would you like to share with us what you're offering um, the winner for this um, contest? Okay, sure. Um, so uh, just to share a bit, so Double Feather Partners is a VC um, that is based out of Japan and operates in Eastern West Africa um, and focuses mainly on um, advisory and investment capital. So um, we'll be offering an initial prize of $500 to the um, winner of the pitch competition. Um, and we'll also be inviting them into our pool um, for potential in investment. Um, the other prize uh, available is through Spurt. Um, and Spurt is a business advisory firm that focuses squarely on SMEs and um, family businesses. And um, Spurt will be offering 2.4 million Naira of advisory services for three months. Um, so those are the two prizes available. Okay, so what I'm gonna suggest is that we're gonna have the first, second and third prizes so that we spread these various um, opportunities across the different contestants as much as possible. Now, um, my head is thinking entrepreneurially and I'm thinking if we have two great speakers like Stephanie and Paul with us, we might as well increase the number of judges so that we have you know, a more balanced judgment. So I don't know if I can invite Stephanie and Paul to also be part of the assessors for this contest. So the, con the various contestants will um, be sharing with us today the problem they're trying to solve, um, the solution that they are proposing, their business models, and their plans for ensuring that they remain um, sustainability, sorry, sustainable, okay? So sustainability will be demonstrated, right? So these are four key um, uh, areas that they're going to be talking about. And um, we can, okay, I think I, think, I, think I should put um, a fifth one, which will be operational efficiency, okay? So how do, have they convinced us that they are operationally efficient? I don't know if you want to put this down so that we all have the five criteria we're going to be using to, to judge the contestants. So the first is the problem they're trying to solve, okay? We give that um, 10 points. Um, the quality of the solution that they're proposing, we give us another 10 points. Their business model, what you think of their business model, okay? That's another 10 points. The operational, I said sustainability before that, but that will come last. Operational efficiency, how well you think that they've been able to put their act together to ensure that they, you know, how did they convince you that they can actually execute or implement successfully? That's another 10 points. And finally, um, their sustainability plan. Can they really be sustainable, okay? That's another 10 points. So altogether, 50 points. So each judge will be looking at these 10 points as they present. I'm saying this out loud on purpose so that the contestants know the criteria they will be used to, um, to, to they will, uh, with which they will be judged. Each contestant has five minutes only to make their pitch. And um, uh, we will, um, I think, um, Sorry, can I ask um, Jacinta to, time, to, to be our timer, to time this um, event for us? Jacinta, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Oh. All right. Okay, so from the minutes they share their slides, we'll begin the timing. So our first contestant for today, um, our first contestant for today is um, Tienye Itsokeari. Okay, so Tienye. Briefly, I mean, um, briefly introduce yourself and share in one minute and share your slide, and then we'll begin the um, pitch competition with you. Good luck. Uh, thank you. Um, good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tanya Sokarari, and I'm the CEO. Hello. Of I need to stop. When it stops, let me please. 
Can you confirm if you can see my um, slide? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, that's great. Okay, all right. Now I'm here to present Cowork NG. Cowork NG is um, Cowork Facilities Limited is a facility management company, and our vision is to provide business support for companies while we try to ensure that we create a balance between work requirement and total business satisfaction. Now we realize that the problem with a lot of MSMEs is they get the availability of capital, power, maintenance costs, security, and other um, issues that they have in setting up their business, especially with the socioeconomic problems that we have right now with the COVID ahead in front of us. Now, we identified some needs, and key among those needs is the cost control that um, they need to implement to be able to manage their finances. Then they also need community support, and they need to be able to pay for the service based on what they use. Now, the correct options available are traditional offices and also um, non-traditional business locations like lobbies, like what we are all doing right now, and other co -work. Why is it important right now? It's because of the economic downturn that the nation is having right now, worsened by the COVID pandemic. A lot, with the fall in oil prices, a lot of companies do not have the same free cash that they use to run their business, and people are trying to manage their operations to be able to keep afloat. So what's Cowork NG provides premium locations across Nigeria, fully furnished and service offices. We create a corporate ambience and every other business support that companies need. And we cover Lagos, Rivers, and soon to be Abuja. We also have um, document control um, services and also have a guest house, which we use to support our clients. This is an example of some of our offices. Now our solution is divided into three. We provide cost efficiency, which we've talked about earlier. And, um, What's coming up right now, a lot of people are talking about working virtually. And to work virtually, you need to be able to have your staff, you need to have your staff strength to be able to increase if need be and reduce when there's no work. So we allow that kind of work flexibility. Now, of course, expansion, you might start in Lagos, but once you work with one of our hubs, you're in Lagos, Port Harcourt, and Abuja, and all our locations. We have different market segments which we play across and also all play across. Now, Cowork was registered in 2017 as Cowork Facilities Limited, which is the first hub in Port Harcourt. Between then and now, we've opened six different hubs, and we have worked with 135 companies across different industries. We have a retention rate of 90%, and the first five clients that work with us three years ago, they are still with us till date. Now, um, Cowork has a very solid team, which they have used to build the company. We've made a lot of mistakes, but we've grown. We've been able to redefine our value proposition as our solutions evolve. Now, Cowork MG is a business, it's much more than a business, um, a working space, it's a business hub because we provide business support and we also give personalized service that ensures that whatever your business is, we can create, um, we can create support for you irrespective of your location. Now, we are looking at scaling based on location and segments. We are currently in 90% in Port Harcourt and 10% in Lagos, but we realize that Lagos is the commercial hub so we need to expand more into Lagos and also into Abuja. Then also segment-based, currently we play on the premium hub level. We intend to go into private hubs and also projectized hubs with our co-op SS. Now, our marketing strategy, we use the four P's of marketing to be able to um, cut across the various segments above the line, through the line, and below the line. This is um, our boutique hotel. This hotel was set up to also give support to our staff. So when they go to Lagos or they go to Port Harcourt or they have clients coming in, they have where to stay because we intend to give an end-to-end -end business support. Now, our justification, job creation. Currently, we have about 42 staff, but we believe that we can get up to 100 staff based on the scaling which we intend to go with. Um, also, um, we do a lot of backward and forward integration. Like with the um, SS3, we try to take care of the end-to-end -end niche of the businesses with the risk assessments. And also, we are very um, technology added in that we use um, Slack, QuickBooks Online, Office R&D, so a lot of physical interface does not occur in our system. Our revenue streams, basically office leads, business support, our bespoke services that we give, and also our lodging, which is something we started one year ago and has really picked up really fast. And um, the word differentiator about what differentiates co-work from the others. We are done, we do an annual revenue of 140 million right now with an operating margin of 32%. Mm -hmm. we believe that 
Hello? Uh, your time Hello. is up. You're going to have to stop. Oh. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So before I call on the next, um, before I call on the next um, presenter, let me correct an omission. Um, I forgot to mention one more um, prize that we have uh, coming from. Um, let me see now. From Lawrence Ogun Egunjobi, who is donating hundred thousand to the winner of this speech. Okay, and I believe Lawrence is present here. So that's another another winner. So we're going to sorry, another prize that we have for this for this speech. Lawrence, maybe you want to say a few words to the participants, maybe to wish them good luck. Do you want, would you like to unmute yourself and say a few words to the participants? Right, thank you, Eretta. Um, my name is Lawrence Olazo Davidson. I'm the CEO of Papercraft um, at Impact Products and Services Limited. I'm an alumnus of Lagos Business School and the yeah. AMB Entrepreneur Virtual Award for 2019. My um, word to advise to the contestants, I think I've been said for that the keynote speaker Mitchell. It is essential to know the power behind <coughs> central entrepreneurship. It's not enough to think that having been funded by this or having been funded by parents and their friends. Lawrence, can you speak closer to your microphone? Because you, your voice is seizing. Can you speak closer to your microphone so they can hear what you're saying more clearly? Right. Okay, thank you. So, um, like I rightly said, not to take so much of the time, um, because time is not um, on the side for this event. The keynote speakers and the um, other panel supporters have said no. What I would like to keep in is for us all, or for the contestants, to take notes of the words of Michelle Elebe. He mentioned frantically, that's really awesome. you funded, or you have your funding that you can make um, that you can make a success out of entrepreneurial. Um, I also want to advise that we should all take important the three pillars which you mentioned about finance, about the power behind successes about influence and contrast, most especially surrounding operational excellence, product leadership, and customer information. All right, thank you so much. And good luck. Okay. All, right, All right, thank you so much, Lawrence. Okay, thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, I don't know, it looks like, I think Kristen would like to explain a bit more about um, the prizes she'll be giving. Kristen, would you like to say something else about your company, the company you're presenting, and um, the prizes you want to offer. All right, okay, so let's get on with the next um, contestant who is, um, thank you so much, Tienye. Um, that was a, a brilliant presentation. And now, Mecca Wosu, would you like to um, come on, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. Thank you, Henrietta. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am Osi Nemeka, and my co-founder, Jelani Ngati, introduces to you, Shorty. What's the problem? Identity problems in Nigeria and Africa at large create very overwhelming, you know, um, risks as regards players in financial transactions. What am I driving at? There is a serious deficit of trust in Africa and Nigeria as well. On a daily basis, people get swindled, people get defrauded in business transactions, people, payments, are delayed, payments are delayed, and in extreme cases, of course, lives have been lost in the case of Jumia. So what, we're trying, what we realize is that merchants and customers are unable to transact adequately and seamlessly in Nigeria as such, Profit margins are lost, businesses are lost. And um, basically, that is part of the problem we realize in that sector. Then the second problem has to do with financial payment. The financial payment solutions in Nigeria 
are quite inadequate. They are highly cash reliant. And given that CBN is trying to move this structure, the society into a more cashless policy driven um, ecosystem, the payment solutions currently on ground are very expensive. The fee structures are very expensive. So people can't transact you know, properly in Nigeria because it's the systems on ground are inefficient. The cost is very high. And micropayments as well cannot be transacted as well. And also in the case of financial inclusion, um, a lot of SMEs, businesses, and individuals do not have access to basic micro loans, as well as health insurance and all that. So what was our solution? The Nigeria ecosystem needs trusted intermediaries like escrows to correct information identity issues in the ecosystem. As such, we're trying to come up with solutions that will make us the primary intermediary for transactions in B2B and B2C markets. Why am I driving at? We're trying to create solutions that enable marketplaces, online retailers, commodity dealers, the guy in Alaba, the guy in Ladipo, to be able to transact seamlessly and easily without having to fear that his products or goods will be lost. And of course, to also protect the users who are the customers from loss of funds and all that. So how did we come up with this solution? We decided we were gonna use an interactive chatbot, which is unique. A lot of SMEs and businesses in Nigeria and Africa, Africa at large are on social media platforms, WhatsApp especially, Telegram, Facebook Messenger. So we are building our solution around the chatbot, which is at the fingertips of, us, of our users. And part of our growth plan is to ensure that we capture the low hanging fruits, which are the online retailers, freelancers, commodity dealers, first, before we actually start scaling to more robust transactions, which are like cross-border transactions and all that. So yes, we're bringing an ecosystem to, soft, to bring solutions, payment solutions, because the current solutions on ground are just pretty much two ways. The bank just provides solutions whereby a buyer can credit a seller. A seller can receive payments. No solution is currently ensuring that both parties intermediaries to these transactions are protected adequately. So that's where our shorty escrow comes in. Shorty pay is an e-wallet solution. However, I'd rather not speak a lot on that because it's part of our scaling plan, which is not, which is further down the road. What is the size of the market we are trying to play in? This is a market that is worth $2 billion as of 2018, and it's expected to double that figure by 2025. Aside those figures, like Mr. Michel said, 39%, that is a whooping number of, of the population in Nigeria are entrepreneurs. So people need these solutions. A lot of people do buying and selling, and it's also evident in our feasibility studies, which we conducted. A lot of people need solutions to ensure that when they are transacting, their goods or their funds are protected. So, which is part of that. What is our competitive advantage? We Competitors in the market. We have three major current competitors. So one should fit all solution. We need to tell up our solutions, our, our payment solutions, to fit into different customer segments. So segments like milestone would prefer milestone payments. Your so some, some transaction. Time up. Right here. Yeah. Time up. Wow. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Shorty Xcrow or Shorty X Xcrow. Uh, Shorty, okay, thank you very much. Right, so I hope the judges are taking note of the different um, criteria to be assessed. Um, I'm going to now call on our one and only lady, Anuli Ajayi, to make her presentation. Anuli, please. Hello? Hello, Anuli, we can hear you. Please share your screen and begin with your presentation. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, my name is Anuli Ajay. Um, I'm the Moodle Executive MBA Class 7, and I'm here to make um, a pitch 
on a children's media and talents development project, Zinc Communications. So what problem are we here to solve? We are here to address the problem of underdevelopment of African children. Uh, it's, a, it's very painful to realize that 10.5 million children aged 5 to 14 years are out of school in a country like Nigeria with all the abundant talents that we have. And it's also a kind of paradox when you consider, you know, how um, the, uh, intelligent our children are winning competitions abroad and all of that. And yet there is no child millionaire entrepreneur in this country. So what is our solution to this problem? We plan to use um, the visual media to educate and empower children by producing educative and enlightening content, you know, that will not only showcase children's talents and help attract you know, sponsors to transform their ideas into businesses, but also promote ethics and value orientation in them. So that by God's grace, you know, the Nigeria of tomorrow will have the kind of leaders that we see. So what are the prospects for this um, business we want to go into? The global video streaming market made 245 billion dollars in 2018 and it's predicted to reach 688 billion dollars by 2024. Now we're well positioned to tap into this opportunity because of the increase in smartphone usage among teenagers um, and then the telcos are also responding by expanding broadband internet across Africa. So we are convinced that the time is now for, for kids and um, Nollywood, children's Nollywood to emerge. So what's our traction so far? Um, on the top right here is our facility, which we've been working on, you know, for some time now. But before then, you know, on a small scale, we have been grooming a few children. Some of them, you know, have been writing short stories, which we plan to publish in a few years from now. Some have been into music production. One or two others are into animation. And these are the talents that we're going to showcase and, you know, have producing these videos that we're going to market. The next thing is we have an industry supplier on our team with broad, you know, network across scriptwriters, you know, and all the resources we need in the Nigerian media. So our facility has space for all of these you know, rooms you see here. We want to produce shows up to like food content, uh, food network quality, you know, kids shows. And we have a music production rooms. All of this will form our set. So what's our competitive edge? There are presently programs you know, on, on Nigerian TV, if you go and watch, but the quality is very poor. Moreover, a lot of them exist only on air. Now our edge as, um, as, as Zinc Media is that we are going to have offline activities that will give life to Zinc communication. Children, you know, our facility, we can host shows, we can host exhibitions of their works, you know, we can organize contests so that they can relate to what we do apart from just having programs on air. Now, who is our target market? Children, basically. Children and adults also who find children's content, you know, appealing. I, for one, you know, I, I, I watch children's programs more than I watch, you know, even um, adult, adult programs. So how are we going to make money? Now, Stephanie mentioned, you know, the um, massive online open programs, and this is one of the things, in addition to making, you know, um, programs, shows, you know, videos to uh, entertain, we are, want to go heavy on education, and then uh, we plan to have an app, you know, to enable us, you know, and, and, and collect our uh, revenue. But, but we have found that children are very powerful teachers. I mean, I struggle sometimes to teach my kids certain concepts in math, but then I call their elder brother, come and teach, you know, Timila in this. And he breaks it down in child speak, that's, and in a simple way that the child immediately grabs it. So we want to produce videos where children are the ones tutoring and, you know, all of that. So we want to make money from advertisement, from all of this, you know, that you see here. So this is our amazing team. And apart from um, Abiodun Shote, who is coming on the team with 10 years of experience in the Nigerian media industry, he's the CEO of Fountain Pictures. Every single one of us here have one thing in common. We have a deep interest in developing children and helping them achieve their full potential. Now, so why, why, why now? The, the decay we see in Nigeria is because of the failure of the you know, adults, leaders of the past to invest in children. So there's no time that is more you know, urgent to focus on children development than this present time if we're to have the Nigeria that we need tomorrow. So in a sense, we're trying to replicate what um, um, LBS is doing, but this time we're focusing on children. So with this, this is the funding that we need to enable us to ach achieve this. Um, and um, United Nations, you know, there's this popular quote from, of theirs that I love. And they said that um, today's investment is children, in children is tomorrow's peace, stability, security, democracy, and sustainable development. We appeal to you to help us accomplish this for the tomorrow that we want. Thank you. Yeah. That was brilliant. So you finished your pitch. Four well, times. fantastic. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, let's see. Next, we have Matthew Inia Kura. 
Matthew, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, my name is Matthew and I'm with the uh, LBS member eight cohort. I hope you can see my screen now. So um, I'm, my name is Matthew and uh, my name, I'll be sharing with you my silver bullet solution to the Nigerian poverty problem. Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world with 96 million living in extreme poverty with many of them being rural farmers. Farmers constitute about 70% of the Nigerian population and so helping them among others improve their income through trade will improve their living standards and give them access to health, education, and uh, self-fulfillment. Governments, development partners, middle-class individuals have been giving them fish and also trying to teach them how to fish with limited success due to challenges So Matthew, we seem to have lost you. There's no voice coming through. To markets, lack of trust, lack of skill. These are some of the challenges to the trade that is required to wean them from the aid system. Our solution will help rural groceries and other product sellers connect with urban buyers and provide the required logistics using shared economy methods. So the E-commerce marketplace for rural grocery products and others consists of the customers and seller apps, while the logistics system uh, consists of intercity ride hailing, sharing, and driver apps for passenger transport and hauling services using cars, buses, and trucks. Jumia has been able to acquire about 6.5 million active users in Africa in eight years who spend an average of $1,000 per annum. The Nigerian e-commerce market is worth about 12 billion, and we look forward to acquiring about 10% of the current 13 million online Nigerian shoppers within our first four years. We believe that we'll be able to offer about 20% lower prices to urban dwellers due to elimination of middleman and improved efficiencies, thus enabling customers to satisfy their cravings in and out of season. The challenge of smartphone penetration is easy enough, and penetration is estimated at up to 40 million at present. Operating at the local market level via agents who will be like one eyed kings also helps mitigate this problem. Meanwhile, other e commerce platforms are focused on different product groups and seller demographics from what we intend to do. So, on the logistics side, competitors are focused on mostly the urban middle class and and traffic outwards from lagos and big corporations furthermore the synergies between both systems promises to provide additional efficiencies there are also possibilities for cooperation with existing logistics platforms so um, we are working to develop our system with weak prototype technologies and experienced technology partner to startups and multiple successful with multiple successful launches, including Precurio, a collaboration and content management platform with sales in over 22 countries. The founder, Mayowa Okegbenle, is a classmate at LBS, and we hope that this platform will be fully operational in about 18 months. Commission agents, among other channels, will be involved with marketing. Um, we will generate our income revenue through commission on sales and trips and on a high volume of transactions enabled by technology. So we look forward to getting an investment of about $500,000 for a 20% stake of the business to cover app development, maintenance costs, and customer acquisitions. And we expect that the company will be worth about $80 million in four years from the start. So uh, on sustainability, there are similar, uh, other similar uh, startups have required long-term financing to be successful because you make losses and then you eventually start to to make profits. 
uh, and, and our case it would not be different from this. However, the, our minimal footprint, that, which is the model we are trying to work on, um, will give us an advantage. We'll minimize... Okay, thank you very much. For your thank, you. thank you, Matthew. Right, so next we have Nana Madri. Nana, please. Is Nana there, please? Can you um, show your video, Nana? Nana, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm so sorry. Okay. All right. Um, can I start now? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nana Madu, CTO at uh, Hobby. Hobby is a social sharing platform which is changing the way in which people share stuff uh, amongst themselves. Now, in the growing poverty um, in Nigeria, which um, Matthew has also mentioned, um, and in the face of the economic recession and the pandemic, um, there has been a, a growing need for Nigerians to be able to uh, access stuff that they need without having to pay through their teeth um, to get it. Um, there is also, sorry, yeah, so, um, so how do we do this? How do we also, how do we uh, ensure or encourage people to share stuff that they no longer need? How do we reduce waste? So our solution um, to this is Hobby. It's a platform that allows you share unwanted items with uh, others, improve savings and reduce waste. So how does the platform work? Easy, sign up, get 1,500 buzzes and start buzzing for items you need or just proceed to upload items that you no longer need so that people can start uh, bidding for them. Now this is, uh, this is what the hobby interface uh, looks like. So as you can see, someone posted a 100,000 Naira wardrobe and um, another person was able to win, win it at 3,800 buzzes, which is less than 500 Naira. Cool, yeah? Um, on the right side, you have um, all the contestants, uh, all the, sorry, all the people who have bidded for the item and the, um, you have the, uh, Rashida who was the eventual winner. Um, so um, let's just track back to our journey so far. So um, we ran a, a page on Facebook to validate this idea. We had about 12,000 members. We uh, recycled about 100, 100 items. And from there, we were able to monitor user behavior and then put it into a product design, which started last year. So we launched at two different events in Abuja and in Lagos. So um, as a result, with our seven months of time, with our marketing, we have about 1,000 plus users. Uh, more than 1 million Naira saved and about 2.5% of our users providing items that have been won by about, uh, by the other 25, by another 25% of users, um, making good our claim that we can actually bridge the inequality gap between the haves and the have-nots. So um, it goes without saying that our, our, our business model or how we're going to make money is by selling bosses. We have four tiers, as you can see. And the, the lowest tier is um, 150 naira, which can get you to 2,500 buzzes. Now, we, we, uh, we intend to play on, this, on the part of the market where you have 65% 65, 65 of internet users in Nigeria who use e-commerce. And assuming a pessimistic value where, where people are buying the lowest tier of 150 naira um, per buzz plan, we expect a revenue uh, of 1.6 billion in three years. And we make bold our, our, our ambition to be able to claim 15% of that market share in three years. So how, do, how, are we going to reach, uh, how are we going to reach our users? So um, from the data that we have from the experiment, for the three year experiment that we've done, um, we, we, we identify that we have people who, who, uh, who, who come to social media looking for giveaways. And we also identify women and mother groups which uh, form the biggest demographics of users in our platform today. And then we also intend to go uh, marketing and partnership with universities, uh, students, religious institutions, NGOs, and then be very visible in waterhole events. So um, these are a few of our, our competitors, most notably um, Gigi. This is the hobby leadership. Um, so you have, uh, we have a team of five led by myself and Miriam, who is the CEO. Miriam and I were classmates at the University of Nottingham where we did our master's in information technology. And that, that is when we started 
brainstorming on a number of ideas, on a number of ideas. We collectively have about 14 years uh, work, work experience in um, IT industry. Uh, she's an alumni of uh, American University of Nigeria. I have, I, I am in LBS. I also have a certificate from Harvard. Uh, so just a few of our other achievements. Uh, we're a top 10 finalist um, out of over 850 contestants from 73 countries uh, for, on the Earth Tech Challenge, which actually took us to Australia to showcase this solution. We've also been recognized by the pres presidency as one of the organizations leading sustainable development in Nigeria. So um, ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you rather share with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana Maru. So last but not the least is Uchenna Okezie. Hello? Are you with us? I'm with you. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Hello everyone, my name is Uche Naokeze. I'm the founder and managing director at At Your Service Technologies Limited, a company that is on track to give employment to 1 million Africans over the next five years. Have you ever experienced being at a job interview where you felt you were just wasting your time because the candidates were not worth it? Or you were the candidate yourself and after answering all the interviewers' questions so perfectly, you were expecting an offer letter, but they never got back to you, or, or if they are polite, they sent you a regret mail, and you are wondering why. Africa's greatest resource is our people, our young people, people with talents, people with skills, and people with loads of enthusiasm. Yet constantly, companies are complaining that their biggest challenge is finding the right people to work for them. Yes, finding the right talents. So over the past 14 months, my team and I are at your service have been working hard to solve this problem for firms through connecting employers to the right talents to work for them. The high unemployment rate in Nigeria at over 20% has guaranteed us a large supply of talents. So really, human resource is not scarce at all. And at the same time, the rise in the number of SMEs and startups means that the demand for smart, qualified employees is unending. Also, high employee turnover in many large organizations has helped to sustain the recruitment business for companies like At Your Service. In the past year, we have helped 14 different employers recruit over 513 employees in Nigeria and Ghana. These include full-time and contract staff who are earning an average annual salary of $4,000. All our clients, 100% of them, have turned to repeat customers, relying on us for all their staffing needs over and over. So now, seeing the way the world has changed due to COVID, we have realized that recruiting will no longer continue to be business as usual. As more employees are being laid off and most companies are doing all they can to cut costs, we do not expect organizations to continue to pay huge fees to agencies to recruit staff for them. So at, at your service, we are currently developing a system that will help recruiters find exactly the right talents they want by themselves online. With our new human resource search engine, we will aggregate qualified candidates across Africa and make it possible to filter uh, by age, location, experience, skills, and interests. Another innovative feature on our platform will be pre-recorded videos of each candidate answering generic as well as just specific interview questions so the recruiter can get to meet them virtually, even before deciding if he wants to meet them in person or not, and avoid wasting their time. But quality of personnel is another thing recruiters are concerned about, and we are aware of this. Employers want to be sure that whoever they are hiring have the right hard and soft skills, have the right hard and soft skills they need to function in the intended roles. So to help prepare the candidates on actual service, we have commenced partnership talks with leading online training institutions like Grovo and Udemy to provide subsidized learning materials for our referrals to add to some of our own training contents we have already hosted on our website at yourservice.ng. The global HR market is $16 billion large with over 700 million people of working age in Africa. 
In just over the past one year, we have generated revenue of over $30,000 from recruiting talents for our clients in Nigeria and in Ghana. With this digitization project, which we have undertaken, that is um, the human resource search engine we are currently building that should be ready as soon as August this year. The, and the aggressive marketing that will follow its launch, we are sure to rake up up to $10 million from this business over the next five years. Our sources of revenue will be from recruitment fees and other associated income. Then commissions earned from our training resource partners, as well as revenue from ads posted on our website, as we are going to have millions of daily website traffic. As you would expect, a company that provides the best talents cannot have anything short of the smartest people on our team. Currently, we have to get Africa working. Since founding at your service in November 2018, the company has been financed primarily through bootstrapping. However, we started with a seed capital investment of $5,000 from the Tony Lumelu Foundation. If you invest in at your service today, you will not only be putting your money into a company that has shown commitment to providing low-cost solutions to the recruitment needs of organizations. You will also be contributing to building a platform that will help at least 1 million young people in Africa over the next five years to land their dream jobs. My name is Uche Nokeze, and I am at your service. Okay. Awesome, Mutima. Thank you so much. Right. So with this, we've come to the end of the presentation by our panelists. So while the judges are um, compiling their scores, and uh, Jacinta, I guess you will be uh, taking the different scores from the judges, we will go on to the, move on to the, um, to the exhibition. Okay, so a couple of our alumni entrepreneurs have sent in videos to show us what they're doing. And um, we'll go through all of those while the judges are sending their scores to Jacinta. I suggest that, well, I don't know what format you have. Maybe you can send them to her by WhatsApp. Jacinta, do you want to give them your WhatsApp number so they can send it to you? Or how would you like this to happen? Okay, I will send my WhatsApp number to all the panelists. I mean, to the judges only. To the, to the judges, yes. I mean, well, for panelists and judges, because now the panelists are also joining the yes. with judges, and then um, you can get the results. So can we have the videos, the videos on the entrepreneurship exhibition? Basically, we focus around solutions that my name is Oyema Amaobi Joseph. I'm the CTO and founder of Amo Series Technologies, a HR and administrative um, technology development company. Um, basically, we focus around solutions that help automate the entire workflow um, for HRs um, and administrative employees, more or less, um, from onboarding an employee all the way um, to the exit of that employee from the system from things like um, employee onboarding, employee document management, lead management, performance appraisals, payrolls, loan management, um, asset tracking, asset tagging, and all whatnot that comes with it. Um, all of those solutions, basically that's um, what I have on my screen here. Um, and the reason I went into this was, um, Earlier, when I got married, um, my wife was in HR and she had issues trying to manage employees. They didn't have the solution. She was doing it on Excel. And so I actually designed a solution to just help her do this, to manage the employees that she had. But um, as we went along, um, within a year two, she had issues where she came back from work and she would always have complaints around unfair treatment of employees, employees coming to her to say they want to report something but they can't say it out, um, female employees being harassed in the office and there's no way for them to report it, employees saying they have unfair um, appraisals, a few people are promoted, other people are not promoted, they are related to their bosses and all whatnot. So, um, I thought I was going to try to do something to fix it and I sat around designing a more robust system from just managing um, employees and their names and what they could do to try to design all of these things into my solution, a way for female folks and males also to report abuses in office anonymously and where those begin to happen or to report it generally, um, to be able to apply for their leaves and where their leaves are refused or where they feel they are unfairly treated in appraisals, their managers have to enter comments and HR has to see all of those comments. So basically, that was what it was all about for me. And then at some point, it scaled into a business. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. 
Considering how much smartphones, laptops, gadgets and accessories have simplified your daily tasks in your homes and offices, would you want to go back to a world without gadgets? I don't think so. My name is Blaze Omelbi and I'm the CEO of Mobile Center and in less than two minutes I'll be giving you a brief overview of my business. Mobile Center is a tech communications company that is in the retailing of smartphones, gadgets and accessories for all levels and classes of people in the society. We sell premium phones like iPhones and Samsung to so mid-budget phones like Techno, Infinix and Huawei to so low-budget phones as low as 15,000 Naira for the low-income earners in the society. In a bid to stand out amongst our competitors, we've targeted the 70% mass market containing the middle-income earners and low-income earners who value price above all as their major purchase drivers and we've introduced services to cater to these customers. We've partnered with fintechs to introduce 3-6 to six months instrumental payments for our customers as opposed to paying the full value of the product. We've introduced huge discounts on all our products to enable customers get better value for money. We've introduced original used iPhones and Samsung to enable our customers get these premium devices at discounted prices without having to worry about the quality issues that come with second-handed products because of the originality of our phones. We've introduced engineering services to enable our customers fix their phones at low cost. Looking at our financial statement, our profit after tax of 35 million in the last three years in inception is testament to our resilience, hard work, and constant focus on the needs of our customers. To contact us, email us at info.mobilecenter.ng or call us at 0813-017-3918. Thank you. My name is Waziri. H and Automation Systems Limited is a multi-award winning ingenious company. We have been providing life safety and security system solutions for the past 14 years. What sets us apart is our ability to integrate this system to work as one. For example, a fire event could trigger a surveillance camera to take a video clip and send to the facility manager, while the alarm system triggers the sirens and simultaneously send the command to the access control system to keep all exit doors open. Several other costs and effects could be designed. However, now we are revolutionizing the conventional IT FDEX with our artificial intelligence assistant called the AI assistant. Our AI assistants are capable of handling all level of support requests with speed and precision. E.g. troubleshooting outlook or Office 365 issues, installing printer software patches updates, account access issues, or even provisioning accounts and hardware for new IRs. The AI agents are available 24 7 and can be deployed via network or social media accounts. That is, regardless of where you are, whether you are in the office or you are working from home, our AI got you covered. If you want to improve your efficiency and productivity, if you want to accelerate your ROI, this is the way to go. We are putting our words out there for companies that need our services. Let us win together. Hello there. My name is Olubu Solamada and I'm the CEO of Feisty Urban Clothing. We are a go-to place for everything apparel customization. Imagine you wearing your thoughts, as in hanging out at that party with friends and expressing your feelings by telling them normal is boring just by wearing it on your shirt. Or going to the movies and you really can't help sh showing off your Game of Thrones t-shirts, telling everybody, it's my favorite series. Or how else will your friends know that you're the coolest in the park if you don't turn up at that beach rave, literally looking like a piece of artwork? Are there millions in the house? Okay, scratch that. Do you have a family function and you want your family to be the envy of the event? Or you want to create corporate t-shirts for your organization? We've got you covered. Check out our face masks. They come in varieties of cool colors and designs and can be customized for both your personal use and as a corporate gift item for your organization. We are the official clothing partner of the member seven class. Did I say more? How about you talk to me and we can create cool designs for your class as well. Extreme customization is our calling and even our website, feistseries.com, upon conclusion, will give you access to create your own outfits online just by using the tools installed. You create, add to cart, make payment, and your items get to your doorsteps within a few days. I have a mission. 
and it's to ensure that you never ever ever have to wear boring clothes anymore our prices are affordable and you can call me or chat me on whatsapp remember for your t-shirt your hoodies your joggers your dress shirts and your face masks i'm the one to contact thank you for your time i'm waiting for your call bye my name is Fola Shadi Ajanoko and I'm the creative director at Bell & Bell. Bell & Bell is a contemporary women fashion brand that was born out of the passion to provide fashionable yet affordable pieces for women that reflects their style. We have two major solutions. We have the bespoke tailoring and we have the ready to wear line. At our ready to wear line, we design and create fashionable pieces for women for their everyday life. So business, work, casual dresses, and what have you. Now in our bespoke tailoring, we customize dresses that suit your style and according to your specification. So for instance, you have your you have an event and you have your ashebi or whatever fabric that you have. These we make according to your specification and to suit your style. We understand that women juggle a lot of things. Um, from trying to build a career to family time and all the other things that's pulling at a woman's time. Yet they want to be fashionable and they want to look good. And so we designed our services such that it's all about you. You define the time, you define the place, you don't have to worry about coming to us. We will come to you from start to finish. Thank you. Hello guys, uh, my name is Mabale, co-founder of Edutris Limited, a transportation and logistics company headquartered in Lagos. With a population of over 21 million people and um, an addressable market size for logistics of over $2 billion, um, it has become important to look at the growing um, parcel delivery market in Lagos and Nigeria and um, which is being hindered by insufficient infrastructure and pricing of legacy companies that is not favorable for e-commerce economics. We decided, to, we decided to provide a solution by coming up with um, a tech-enabled solution which is called Shipio. Shipio is your next generation app that leverages on technology to deliver efficient and effective service to customers. Shipio builds a community of on-demand delivery associates across every major um, city. We have been able to support SMEs by providing data and analytics to show transparency and to balance the complexities um, associated with last mile demand and, um, and delivery. Shipio with Shipio, we intend to be Africa's largest delivery community by driving availability and efficiency in the on-demand space. We have also developed a job assignment algorithm which would save 35% of current delivery at um, scale. Our target markets are e-commerce companies, social commerce com food and confectionery merchants, and other businesses. Now, we have a team who has um, garnered experience over the years, a team of um, senior profiles with remarkable experience in e-commerce logistics, product design and development, um, and business development. So far, we have achieved, um, in about two years now, we've achieved about 40,000 um, parcels delivered in our last mile community and 8% margins on, on revenue. With further investment, we can even scale further. Would you not rather try us and let us disrupt the market? My name is Mary A. I'm the creative director of this World Collections. I'm a fashion business that creates and sells African inspired fashion objects such as bags and footwear. Uh, the business started as a solution and it's sort of a passion I got from trying to create things in my hands. And what I meant to use my methods had both things in the past, such as the bags and shoes that didn't last. And hence, I need to come up with a solution for myself and for others. And I learned how to make bags and footwear. And by doing so, I was able to also sell it to people that were interested. And that was how this business started. Right now, we produce products that are durable, trendy, and comfortable. And our materials are sourced locally from local vendors. What is unique about us is that we provide amazing products at the best price possible. So all our products are affordable. 
we have some money. We have the luxury to you. So it also come in your new designs actually. You can get this for yourself with big beads. And if you are new or full, you can get this for And it's very direct. We have the Lloyd Sander, very flexible. I love this product. It's very flexible. It's waterproof. Yes, and you can wear it anywhere. It's very, very handy. We also have another energy design, which is very durable, comfortable, and perfect for casual look. And we have the Kakun Sander, which I love very much. And yes, we have our stamp on most of our products. So we don't, you know, compromise quality for anything. All our products last for a minimum of three years. And I love this. Thanks for turning with us. We hope you patronize us. Yes. Thank you. The need for an eye class of the suits Nigerian weather has been of great concern to the beauty world. My name is Doris Mkan and I am the CEO of Lenders. I bring to you the tattoo pencil. It comes in black, light brown, and brown color. What is, why is it a tattoo eye pencil? Why do you need this pencil? The reason is, it's smooth resistant. It doesn't clean off for 12 hours. It's, it lasts very long, and it's waterproof, like what I'm doing now. It stays. Another interesting thing about the pencil is that the ingredient is gotten from Nigeria. The tattoo pencil is very easy to wear and that's why I think it will be wonderful to invest in this product. This is it. The tattoo eye pencil. Linda's tattoo eye pencil. My name is Shinya Kahedo and I'm representing Nani Scott. How would you like to eat your cake and still have it? Oh, better still, how would you like to spend less time in the kitchen yet enjoy healthy, nutritious meals? Have you noticed that, that as we get busier and busier in the bustle of Lagos, our meals have started to get boring, less nutritious, and less healthy? Our pasta that used to look like this now looks like this. Bills that used to look interesting like this is now presented in this form. Even our beloved rice that used to look enticing like this is looking more and more like this. I'll tell you why. It takes so much time and effort to buy, wash, scrape, chop, dice and slice vegetables that makes these meals look enticing, interesting and nutritious. So, Nani Scott decided to offer a solution. We present to you freshly cut, thoroughly cleaned, diced, processed, ready to use the vegetables, carrots, bell peppers, runner beans, green peas, green beans, all between 500 naira and 1,150 naira. In two months since we have offered these solutions, we have targeted domestic kitchens alone. And we have turned over my initial investment of 5,000 naira 26 times in two months, targeting domestic kitchens alone. I'm inviting you today to join me as we scale up to cater for commercial and industrial kitchens with approximately 100 events per weekend in Lagos alone. The potential in this market is enormous. The opportunity here is huge. These commercial and industrial users deserve the opportunity to spend less time in the kitchen, yet present beautiful, healthy and nutritious meals for their guests. Thank you for listening. So you want to build a tech product? Maybe.
baby mobile or a web app or even both, you've got high hopes. This product is going to change everything. So who do you want to make responsible for building that big project of yours? A developer? Two developers? Three? No, you need a team. Project the brand. In the language your audience will understand. We ensure that your app becomes a brand name, a name that everybody was identified by. We are a company focused on building winning products. After the mobile app is done, what next? On the Play Store, on the iOS Store, who gets to know about this message? Who knows about the mobile app? That's what I do. Hiring the right talent, capable of building the next big bang, that's my thing. I understand how important clients' projects are, and as a company, we do not compromise on quality, as quality is our watchword. Our Badders brand and marketing team, put together, are ready to deliver you our project to the next big deal. Okay, developer is all you need to make your software. A friend called me the other day and said, Maya, I need your help. I've put a lot into this project and my developers are messing me up. And I'm like, who told you a developer is responsible for the entire software development process? That's like saying a mechanical engineer is responsible for the entire car production process. Do you want to know what your car would look like if it was designed by a mechanical engineer? Making great software products is a process that requires a team with a diverse skill set. But I'm not here to talk about the world-class team I've put together. I'm here to ask you a question. Who would you trust with that big project of yours? If you want us on board, please get in touch with us. We are a call away. Thank you. Let the winner in you come alive in full swing. Let your kids have fun like you never did. Let the waters inspire you to recreate. Let our homes remind you of how far you've come. Don't just live on the island. Live in a resort. Royal Palm Villa, your preferred destination. Right, so Justin, are we ready? Can you unmute? Yes. Okay, yes, we are ready. I have this course from just four judges, uh, from okay. Christine, Glory, Stephanie, and Richmond. Okay. I don't know, can I go ahead and read this course? I think that Paul is going to send you his... His oh, his, his own just came in now. So just okay. a minute, let me calculate his. Okay, all right. So in the meantime, let me see. Um, Richmond, do I have you available, uh, Stephanie? Are you there? Okay, great. Richmond, are yes, you I still? Am. Okay. All right. So while I, uh, while um, Jacinta is collating the scores, maybe we can answer some of the questions I saw um, coming in after the. Well, there are lots of comments about the panelists. Many people giving all of you kudos, which I fully agree with. Um, let me see now. Um, okay, so the kudos have taken over the chat screen. Uh, let me try and get back to the questions that I saw. Uh, okay, so um, okay, someone is saying, um, is value what customers always understand? Or is it something an entrepreneur can be convinced about and customers may come to see the value and go for it? I may be developing a product people think is of no value and nobody will pay for. So at times we create the value and people come to buy. Did you get the, que did you get the question? I think that what the person yes, is I trying- did. I did, I did. Okay, all right. You, would you like to um, respond? Well, well, I think it's a really important point, and, um, or rather, important question. The truth is that it works both ways. Sometimes the customer is not able to conceive the value that 
he needs, you know, so to speak. But all the time, the customer is always able to recognize the value when it is delivered. They are always able to recognize the value when it is delivered, but they may not be able to conceive it. A very good example is the iPhone, okay? We didn't think of the iPhone as being, I mean, the original concept of the iPhone, of having a, uh, the coming together of our music system, the internet, and the phone. Without being that techy, you may not have been able to conceive it. But the moment it was offered to you, you could recognize that, hey, here's value for me. So I think what is to be made clear here is that, yes, customer doesn't flow from, I mean, sorry, value doesn't always flow from customer to the entrepreneur. But what is clear is that the customer is always able to recognize value when it is presented to them. Right. Okay, I want to agree with you on this one because even if the customer doesn't ask for, for something, the, whoever is creating the product or service has to have in mind the solution or the purpose. It has to be purpose-driven because if a customer doesn't ask for something but finds something that actually is a solution or helps him get his work done or her work done, I guess they will, they will be willing to pay for it. So it can go both ways. Either you get the idea for the product from the customers or you envisage a pain point and create something to, 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 meet, to meet that need. Okay, Paul, let's say something. Yes, please, go ahead. Yes. Um, yes. In regards to the value coming from either you, the entrepreneur, or from the people you're prospecting to sell this value to, it, it, it's actually um, part of the risk that entrepreneurs take. Because like he said, what you might perceive as value, when you put the idea out there, would probably fail you. So sometimes you find that you might have gone into one, two, three, you know, innovations that you think will be value, will be of value. And one of them would just be the right one that would give you that hit. Talking as an entrepreneur, before we launched what, what gave us the international acclaim we, 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 re we reckon today, it's not as if we've not been trying to shun out some products before now that we felt were valuable to the customers, but not all of them gained the traction this one give us so sometimes it's like like you like a, a musician who goes on releasing songs songs the one he least expects will become the one that probably put him in the national limelight so sometimes you just continue to do what you do it's all part of the entrepreneurial drive where you continue to create that value and you would find the one that would actually match the customer's expectation and it would pay off for all the other ones you've tried and failed um I think also, a, 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 sorry, a contribution from, um, okay, Kristen wants to say something. Yeah, no, I was going to say that the other aspect of this is that um, I think when you have very technical or very brilliant um, founders, entrepreneurs, especially those that um, really believe in their idea, there's also an assumption that the value is obvious. And so it's also just positioning for your end user in a way that makes it clear to them, not just in terms of how clear it is to you, but actually clear for your end user what the value proposition is. Because I think that when you're really passionate about something and when you have a really clear understanding of the value, you assume that people are going to have the same reaction that you do. And so sometimes there's an inadequate amount of attention paid to the importance of sales and the importance of a really, really clear um, marketing and communication strategy. Um, and so it might not even be that the product isn't the right one. It might just be that it's not being um, presented properly. Okay, awesome. Right, so final word from um, Stephanie, and then we'll go to announcing the winners of this competition. Okay. So I really like that question because that is that sort of happened to me. So because I was pioneering a new idea, a lot of people did not understand what I was saying four years ago. And so you, that you are the entrepreneur, you may be very passionate about what you're doing, but very few people will see it. It's very common. So it's actually a very common thing. And what you'll find is that um, in the beginning, when you start out, you just have to look for your early adopters, all right? People who understand what you're saying at that point. It may not be a lot, but stay there. 
if you remain consistent, what will happen is that the, it's, it's like a curve. It will start, the market will start changing and they'll start understanding what you're saying. But if you, if you give up too early, you might just lose a great opportunity. And there are many, I think this is something with the trend with most tech businesses. And when you start, there are early people, there are early adopters, but with time, other people come along. If you look at Zoom, Zoom has been here for quite some a while, and there were early adopters who used Zoom, all right? But it's until COVID that there was just this influx who just came in. So in the beginning, your value may be only be clear to a few people. If you can find a proportion of those people that can keep you profitable, stay at it. The more you keep going, the more you have testimonials, the more you have case studies, the more you have real results, they will become your loudspeakers who show people the value. Because like Christine rightly said, sometimes you're too inside that technical thing that you can't really communicate the value. But some other person might be able to communicate it better than you when they show other people how they have actually applied your solution. And with time, if you remain consistent, it, you, your, your, your platform or your business will grow. Sorry, Hertie, I just want to add this real quick. Value creation is not an event, it's a process. Value is created by both parties. That is why it is recommended that you put the idea out there. And then you can then iterate the idea to reconcile what you perceive as value with what the customer finds valuable. So it's really a process of experimentation and iteration. And that's where a lot of entrepreneurs really, you know, they wait till they find that thing that, it, that seems quite valuable to them. And then they take it to the market. And then they realize that, hey, the market doesn't, this doesn't really reconcile very well with the market. So value creation is not an event. It's a process. And the process involves experimentation, iteration, to reconcile those positions. Thank you. Absolutely. And this is what the feasibility study does for you. So during the feasibility study, yeah. when you release your minimum viable product, you're testing and getting feedback to refine your initial thinking till you get to that point where you arrive at the product as the market wants it, okay? And at the right price. Great points. Right. So um, just before I ask Jacinta to um, announce the winners, I'd like to just make sure that the, 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 those giving the gifts are happy with this. So I'm trying to, I'm suggesting that rather than have one winner take all the, all the presents, I'd like us to sort of um, prizes amongst the three, um, three top ones. So, for, um, so I'm proposing, without knowing who the winners are, um, that perhaps Kristen Wilson, who's representing, um, who's the Vice President for West Africa, um, for Double Feather Partners and Co-Founder Spread Group, um, gives the first prize. That Glory Ainaya, the Regional Representative for Faster Capital, gives the second prize. And that Lawrence Egunjobi gives the third prize. Are we happy with that? Could we unmute and just signify our consents or otherwise? Can I, make, can I make a comment, uh, Dr. Henretta? Okay, so, okay, so it's essentially, um, I, there was something I discussed with Jacinta earlier that I just felt I should share with, 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 the, with the participants. So, Faster Capital invests in even ideas, if you have a solid idea and it's not um, fairly flexible, but it has promise, they're willing to invest. So. Uh, in addition to, of course, giving priority to the second, to the first runner or the second prize winner, we're also happy to take a look at um, some of the other pitches because okay. even though maybe, yeah, even though they were not, they may not have been competitive compared to the winner because of maybe the attraction. But if the idea is solid, you know, we're very happy to to okay. take a second look at even, yeah, so. Thank you so much, Glory, because personally, I wouldn't like to declare a winner. I would like all of them to be winners, but the competition yeah. won't be winner, so we have to get, we have to announce a winner. All right, so I um, okay. can see on screen. Um, I will ask, she will be making the closing remarks on this, um, of, at, at the end of this event. So um, I hope we're all happy with the decision. Lawrence, are we okay with, to go, are we good to go with the, with that position? Our, our initial, um, 
discussion with the career placement and entrepreneurship um, organization. Um, Expo organizing committee was to well encourage the winner um, for that much of um, a token from us and me as the Hamba Entrepreneurship Award finalist. But if right. you think, if please, if you think that will be in the right um, direction for us to proceed with, I don't have an issue with it. Okay, so the point is, everybody, I, I'm just trying to make sure as many people as possible get some benefit from this event. If you still prefer to give your your um, don your prize donation to the winner, that's that's fine. Which is why I'm asking now if everybody's happy with with the. I think um, me and my management and board would like to give to the winner, and we would like to do this every other year. Fantastic. So we go with that. We go. We go. We go. We go with that. Okay. All right. So. Um, okay. So and um, Christine. Your, your, um, what would you like to go with? Um, so I was actually just sending a message to ask that could you just iterate? I didn't hear the, the breakdown. Apologies. Right, so I was, I was going to say just so that more people can, more, more of the participants, contestants can benefit from the gifts. I was going to say rather than give all three prizes to one contestant we spread out the, the, the prizes. And so I had suggested that you give the prize to the first winner and the, uh, Glory gives the prize to the second winner and Lawrence the third winner. Lawrence would prefer to still give his prize to the winner of the contest. Um, Glory is happy to give, the pri to give prizes to more than just the winners because she'll be happy to look at any business that has potential which means that she is looking beyond just the first, second, and third contestants. And, um, well, I guess in your case, since you already um, initially agreed to donate the prize to the winner, it really doesn't make a difference. Or I don't know what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, I was about to say, it looks like, yeah, it's, it looks fine. I'm, I'm fine with whatever is fine, yeah. Awesome. All right. Hey, right. Can, I just, can I just make a contribution on this? Um, yes. You know, at the end of the day, everyone is a winner to be honest. And, um, you know, it's beyond the prize and all of those things. But I think that it may be best to stick with the original idea, the concept, because it amounts to, you know, more or less changing, like a comment. There's a comment in the chat. Somebody says it's changing the, the goalpost in the middle of a match, you know. So well, they are all winners, to be honest. And I bet you, based on the presentations they have made, they may even find people who might be interested in working with them on this. So, you know, it's really not about the price, but, but it's, it's really not about the price. Richmond, just going with the comments again, what he's saying is fair to distribute the prizes to everyone. Okay, but it's okay. I mean, I think that Lawrence has expressed his desire to remain to stick with the first one and I've accepted. Um, Glory is ready to accommodate as many contestants that have good ideas and I love that okay Christine is happy with what everybody is happy with so well we're, we're all back to being one big happy family okay right so um and I'm hoping that amongst the audience there will be people who will be willing to take on you know um, some of the contestants as mentees or invest in them because I think that they all have fantastic ideas Right, so the time has come, Jacinta, for you to be, to announce um, the winner. I guess you will start from the sixth position up to the first. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay, I'll start with the runners up before I get to the top three. So um, the sixth position goes to, for the sixth position, we have um, French Farmers with 158 points. And then for the fifth position, we have um, co-work with 173 points. And then we have the fourth position, it goes to Sorty with 178 points. And then the third position goes to Zinc Communication with 181 points. And the second position goes to At Your Service with 202 points. And the winner is Hobby with 203 points. So they are all winners. 
right. So we now have, as we all said, everybody's a winner. But when you know for in doing contests, there are different things that make some people stand out more than others. But honestly, when we were shortlisting all six of you, we loved all your ideas. So I want everybody to go away from here feeling like a winner. So I'll now hand over to the Dean, Professor Ernesto Conedo, who will give the closing remarks for, or maybe should we ask the, should we ask the contestants to say some the, the, the first three contestants before the Dean closes the event? Yes, should we? Okay, all right. So a word from the contestants. Um, so who's the third one again, um, Jacinta? Unmute yourself, please. Zinc communication. Zinc, up here. Let's see. What's your business idea about again? Just, and then say something. Wow. Zing. Um, I, okay. I am sure. Wow, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be just I thank LBS for this platform, for this opportunity. I'm so blown away. I don't know what to say. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for pushing me to do this, Jacinta. Thank you, Dr. Henrietta, for the support yesterday. I didn't think I could. My team and I, we are awfully grateful. We look forward to, you know, doing great things and making a change in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Anuli. Right. Second position, Jacinta, on mute. Yes. Yeah. At your service. Put you At your service. Uh, I'm really grateful to LBS for this opportunity. For some strange reason, my camera is not coming on. I don't know why. Uh, I noticed only after the pitch, my camera isn't coming on. But I'm grateful for the opportunity. I, I would appreciate some feedback um, you know, on my pitch so I can do better next time. Congratulations to Hobie and to all the other contestants. Like, oh, uh, to said, are all winners, uh, one way or yeah. the other. So Absolutely. hopefully we need to do more with LBS and with everyone else in the audience. I'm very grateful. Uchenna, always at your service. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> right. And Hobe. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So everybody, thank you, Jacinta. Thank you, Dr. Areta. Thank you, Dr. Nase. Thank you, uh, Christine. Thank you to all the judges, uh, Mr. Richmond, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Rajaka, thank you every single person that has made this happen. Um, my wife forgot that she was pregnant, that she was jumping up, so I had to go. <laughs> I had to go and, uh, <laughs> yeah, so thank you to everybody that has made this happen, and um, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's been an incredible journey. Um, today I've learned a whole lot uh, from uh, Mr. Michelle and the panelists, and uh, I look forward to um, putting this encouragement to um, good use and scaling hobby um, even more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, contestants. Right. So I'm handing over straight off to the dean. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that Nanda has made my job uh, easier because he has thanked everybody. But I think that this has been a very exceptional LBS MBA Entrepreneurial Expo and Contest. And I must thank uh, Dr. Henrietta Onwe uh for all the work that went into putting this together. It's been a brilliant morning well spent. And I think that for all of us who were here uh, today and have listened to this, very useful contributions have been made. I think enough to excite the entrepreneurial juices in all of us. There's several opportunities, challenges, and yet a bright um, horizon. You know, we can't say, I think it's a bit hard for us to say thank you for a pandemic. Uh, but, you know, if this hadn't happened, I'm not so sure that we would have had this opportunity with the number of people that we saw that participated today to uh, listen in on this and to be able to learn um, a lot of things here. So I'd like to begin by thanking our keynote speaker. I know he's not here right now, but um, we want to extend our thanks to Michel Lelegbe for the very insightful talk and advice. And I do agree with Michel that uh, there's a time and there's seasons and we should plan for seasons. His view is that this too will pass uh, sooner rather than later. But I think that for all of us, we must be cognizant of the opportunities that arise from time to time, but still have our eyes on the long term and then what we can uh, do in that uh, regard. Uh, to the panelists, I think for taking the time to spend the Saturday morning with us for the very useful comments and contributions. Uh, it was, I learned a lot 
uh, just from the contributions of all the panelists. Very delighted at the LBS alumni and what they're doing in their respective fields and their contributions as, as well. To all the contestants, uh, thank you. As Richmond just told us a few minutes ago, uh, everyone is a winner. You know, yes, it's true. Everyone is a, is a winner. You know, but I must commend the creativity that has gone into a number of the ideas that we saw here today and for working hard to put this plan uh, together. For the panelists, I'm, I'm sorry, the finalists, uh, Nana Hobe, uh, well done, very well done for putting this uh, together. I think that all the plans were very well received and I must thank everybody for willing to venture in these uncertain times, which we hope will pass uh, sooner rather than later. I enjoyed the pitches by the exhibitors, all of them there, very interesting ideas there, and to the audience at large, especially those who joined in uh, at 11 this morning and have remained with us. Hetty, I think that is a testament to how engaging this is, that, you know, at this time, we still have well over 200 people that have remained on, on this. Very well done. The MBA department, Jacinta, well done. Uh, your energy and your passion and your drive, I think, is outstanding. Thank you very much for all that you have uh, done in this uh, regard. So it only remains to congratulate all the winners and to thank all that set out this morning to invest wisely in the same. At Lagos Business School, we will continue to drive entrepreneurship in Nigeria and indeed in Africa. This is consistent with our vision of building socially responsible managers on the continent. And all of you would agree that leadership and sustainable development is highly needed. And if we're going to do anything to tackle the looming problem or well, the existing problem of unemployment, then I think that entrepreneurship is the way to go. Well done to all involved. It's been a worthwhile time. I'd like to thank you all and say to you, please keep safe. Thank you all very much. Right, so um, on this note, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for attending. Jacinta, the backbone, always play, being the main stakeholder, connecting everybody together, well done. Um, I'm happy that this has been quite successful. We've had well over 300 participants and right now we have about 260 something still on. So I guess we've all learned a lot. So contestants have fun um just before we go away um i think lawrence would like to um make a presentation of his gift to the to hobe and um perhaps um glory and and christine would also like to to say something maybe we should start with christine and then move on to um glory and then lawrence. right christine um, well, I just want to say congratulations, and of course, uh, DFP and SPURT are available to have conversations with um, any and all uh, entrepreneurs that are interested in sort of moving their businesses forward. Uh, but ultimately, congratulations and well done. All right. Okay. Uh, Glory? Okay. Congratulations to everyone like I, uh, for participating. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, we're interested in every idea that has a promise, so we will be in touch with others, even those that didn't uh, make, quite make it to the finals and those that, that didn't win. In addition, um, the platform Corporate Africa can help with investment readiness, because one of the things we find is that you might want to raise capital, but in terms of getting your numbers right, your pitch, your valuation, there are many one things that go into raising capital still. So on a pro bono basis, we can also help you prepare to access finance. So come back to everyone. Thanks for having us. Okay. Right. Lawrence? Um, on behalf of my management and board of our impact of we would like to congratulate the winner of the third LBS Entrepreneurship Expo contest. We also want to encourage that all the contestants were all winners. Um, they tried to put up good solutions together which we can develop. I also need to encourage everyone, both from the first, from the sixth to the um, first winner, that an idea is an idea, irrespective of the fact that um, we all want together and somebody made the first, doesn't mean that you didn't develop on your idea. You never say never. It may be the best idea ever sold in Africa. So thank you everyone. We are Papercraft would like to give you a gift of um, a check of 100,000 to Hobby as the um, winner of this um, 
Entrepreneurship Expo concept. For the fact of the um, pandemic and restriction, and for the fact that it's a virtual um, Entrepreneurship Expo, we would um, give Helby the opportunity for us to also do an electronic transfer to their account so that so as to stop delay instead of them having to pick up the check at um, Career Center in LBA. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing everybody next year. And I, in part, look forward to doing the same next year. Thank you, Dr. Eretta. Thank you, LBA. Thank you all. All right, so have a pleasant day and um, see you all again next year. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you too.